Good morning. For, for me, thank you, Chair. Oh,
Good morning. Good morning. Are you still there? Are you alive today? Are we on? Okay. Um, Dr. Mona, are you in, Doc? Uh, Honorable uh, Mtetwa, Honorable Mtetwa, we need to apologize to Honorable Mtetwa. Uh, uh, we are apologizing, Honorable Mtetwa. Uh, you have been in the platform and we were still having some uh, challenges. Now we are going to start, I'm suspecting, according to uh, today's program, we are going to start with uh, uh, Dr. Mona. So we are waiting him uh, to get in. Dr. Mona? That's fine, Chair. Thank you. Thank Apology you. accepted. Thank you, Honorable Member. Uh, Dr. Mona? Good morning, Chair. Hello, Dr. Mona. Um, Dr. Mona. Hello, Doc. Yes, Doctor. We're still experiencing some technical difficulties. Uh, Dr. Mona is still trying to fix them. Okay, we'll wait, Doc. Okay, thank you very much.
Hello. Yes, Doc. Yes, I'm back. Uh, uh, can you show uh, us who you are through the video and then you can switch it off in case it can disturb you through e network? Please, Doc. I hope you can see me. Uh, are you in the car? Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm traveling. Okay. But um, in network, uh, maybe uh, we'll... Um... Are you sure that as we are driving, uh, you are going to... I stopped. Yes, that, that's what I wanted to propose, but I was thinking that you're supposed to to know that maybe as you are driving, you'll get in a point where there's no network. Um, uh, thank you, Doc. Um, we do welcome you. Uh, here we are uh, uh, as the Committee of Parliament. Uh, we are all here today. Uh, with all the members of the committee. We have one member which is in virtual. We have allowed him and we have uh, the entourage of e parliament. We have our doctors, our legal people, our translators, uh, our researchers, our contact advice, and then our secretariat. So we are all here. Uh, we let me take this opportunity. Doc, in December 2023, the Minister of Sport, Arts and Culture issued a call for the public to nominate individuals that would serve on the Pan South African Language Board, Pan's Lab in brackets. Uh, the call was regulated by the provisions of Act 59 of 1995. Subsequently, a total of 134 nominees, of which 81 were males, 52 females, and one not declared, whether male or female, were received. Uh, thereafter, uh, a selection process uh, identified 25 nominees to be shortlisted to interview for interviews to make recommendations to the minister. It must be noted that Section 5 of the Act indicates that a minimum of 11 and a maximum of 15 people must constitute the board. To this end, the interviews that we are conducting will shortlist no more than 20 candidates that will recommend to the minister for appointment. As the act dictates nominees and interviews um, to serve uh, in the interviewers to serve in the pants lab board must possess an array of experience Expertise, including language, legally, human, human, res human resources, and the financial skills. There are necessary skills that will enable PANSLAB to achieve its ultimate strategic objective of promoting multilingualism and social cohesion. To conclude, I congratulate you for having shortlisted for these interviews and hope that you will convince the panel that you are the right candidate for Pansla Board. Also, I extend my best wishes to the members of the Portfolio Committee that are conducting these interviews. I trust that 
uh, that we will find the best candidates from amongst the shortlisted nominees. I thank you as the chairperson of this committee, Beauty Zulane. I thank you, Dogodel. Thank you, Honorable Zulane. Uh, thank you, thank members of parliament. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Uh, can Doc now introduce yourself uh, within five minutes? You must not forget that we have your own CV with us, but would love that. Can you talk to us uh, within that five minutes, Doc? I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable. Uh, my name is Bulin I have... Uh, uh, the second name Godfrey, and the same name is Mona. I'm a language practitioner, language activist. Uh, let me start with education. I have a, a degree, honors, masters, and PhD uh, focusing on the East Coast language and literature. Uh, I have uh, been. Am I audible? Uh, try am to I audible? try to raise your voice, Doc. Uh, um, we're trying uh, uh, to listen to you, but you are not hundred percent audible. Let me try again. <clears throat> Thank you, Honorable Julane. Thank you, Honorable Mom, members, for affording me the opportunity. Uh, I, I hope now I'm audible. Yes, uh, 100%. I, 100%. Yes. yes. I, my name is Volin Jela Godfrey Mona. I am born and bred in the, in the Eastern Cape. I have studied in the Eastern Cape universities. Forte and Rhodes University. I hold a PhD in African languages, uh, focusing on Isikosa language and literature. Uh, work experience, which uh, I think will be will show will demonstrate my capabilities and experience. I started in 1981 as a teacher and I moved on to the Department of Education, and I was, in fact, when I was a teacher, I was teaching history and history courses. I moved to the Department of Education, uh, where I was trained as a translator by the linguist, professor, who is now professor, retired professor Mtuse. I, I was a translator for years. I was trained in translating and interpreting there. And I moved in 1990 to the University of Forte. I was actually recruited to the language unit at the University of Forte, it's a language center. We worked very hard there with the director and we developed the center and developed it and, and um, transformed it in, into a center for cultural studies. Uh, some of the members will know the project at Forte that was responsible for collecting the archives of the ANC. We included that function, the history part, preservation and conservation of the heritage in our center. Uh, but in 1996, you know, I uh, joined the Department of Education in the, in the Eastern Cape, where I was requested to establish a language unit for the Department of Education. Uh, in 1997, we established a fully fledged department of sport, arts, and culture, where I was I started as a, a deputy director responsible for languages and the language unit, and I was promoted to director in 1991. For 18 years, I've been a director of arts and culture, and 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 also a acting director, chief director in the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture, responsible for languages and literature, responsible for heritage, uh, museums and heritage, responsible for libraries and archives. Um, I can safely
me uh, uh, say that I have uh, experience and academic qualifications with, which, which, which will enable me to make a significant contribution, you know, to, towards Bantal. I've worked closely with Bantal, and I know they are good work that they have done. But there is an aspect that I want to focus on and emphasize. That's why I'm interested in joining uh, Pantal. I'm a retired person now, but the universities invite me to make a contribution. For instance, currently I'm teaching language acquisition at Rhodes University. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Doc. Now, five minutes on the dot. Uh, we are doing this talk to everyone. We'll, we are monitoring the time. Out of your 45 minutes, we do give uh, any member, uh, candidate, if five minutes. If uh, you didn't finish your five minutes, uh, when we are introduced, it's a bonus. Now, According to the questions, you are left with 40 minutes. You want this to be recorded to everyone. Now, Doc, thank you so much uh, about uh, yourself telling who you are. As I was said that uh, also we do have your CV, but it's, uh, it's professional uh, to say again, tell us who you are. Now, Doc, uh, I'm going to give uh, an honorable Zondi to ask a question to you, Doc. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And good morning, uh, Honorable Doctor Mona. Here is your first question What is your understanding of linguistic human rights and its linkages? to linguistic diversity and multilingualism. Why would it be important for you to argue for multilingualism in South Africa? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable. Honorable, uh, we are all in this country uh, responsible for implementing the, the constitution of the country. Uh, which was a decision, a document that was, uh, you can say, uh, developed by the entire community of the, of, 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 of the country. Everybody was given a con- uh, an opportunity to make a contribution. And we agreed on multilingualism because we want to ensure that all the rights all the citizens of the country are preserved. They are conserved. We wanted to ensure that no rights of an individual are violated. By multilingualism, we mean that we accommodate all the languages. We have 35 languages in the country, about 35. But we agreed on on, 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 on 11 that this will be official. But there are more than uh, 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 12, the 12 that we have agreed on now, That's about 35, but we compromised, agreed on only uh, focusing on the on the 12. And we are saying that all of us in South Africa, all the languages, be they languages that are official, be they languages that are not official but spoken in the country, be they what is called dialect, because that also is debatable what a dialect is, what a, a, a language variety is. Uh, it, it, it is. All of them must be fully developed, given full opportunity. We must all try uh, to, to learn and communicate in the languages that are spoken in the country so that nobody is, is, is uh, disadvantaged. That's what we mean by multilingualism. Multilingualism is critical in this country for communication because uh, language is, 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 is very, very critical for political, social, economic, religious uh, 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 development in the country. 
Uh, that's why we emphasize multilingualism. Nobody must be disadvantaged. Everybody must be able to express himself freely, share ideas, make a contribution politically, socially, economically, religiously, and so on. That's in a nutshell. That's what I can say about multilingualism. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Doc, uh, the next uh, honorable member who's going to ask you a question is Honorable Adams. Honorable Adams. Thank you very much, Chairperson. And good morning to Dr. Mauna. Doc, my question will be Section 2, 6 of 2 of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa acknowledges that indigenous languages are facing a challenge of diminishing, and this requires the state to take practical steps and positive measures to evaluate um, the status and advance the use of these languages. What is your opinion on, on this section? What measures would you put in place to ensure that the state including provinces and municipalities comply fully with the constitutional requirement. I thank you, Doc. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Member. Um, my input uh, uh, with this is that I fully support this. And uh, it, uh, for my entire career, I've been uh, trying to make a significant contribution to ensure that this this goal, you know, is, is, is realized. And we can only uh, realize this goal if we ensure that we encourage at the lowest level of education, you know, a, 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 an education that acknowledges uh, all the languages of the country, an education that supports all the languages of the country. But practically, that may be difficult to achieve. And therefore, let's start very hard with bilingual education. You know, the work that our education department currently is doing of promoting bilingual education, that will be a starting point, a good starting point. You know, and then going to the, 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 the level of, 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 of um, uh, uh, universities, we have to ensure that the universities are capacitated to carry out research, to carry out research. And therefore, what is promoted by the department, the HET, of having language units within the university must be encouraged and supported financially. Uh, but unfortunately, there are obstacles there. Uh, 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 I will not get into that at, at the moment. And then, with the policy, we have policies, we have developed policies as a country, and I commend the country, I commend the portfolio committee, because we have policies in, in terms of status planning, in terms of stated, uh, status planning. As a country, we have moved a, a long way, uh, and, and what we need to work hard on is the area of corpus planning, ensuring that if we are saying that speak the languages. Do we have the resources for that? Do we have the books? Do we have material that will assist people? Do we have the dictionaries, the lexicons, and so on, you know, to assist, you know, our goal of moving into the area of, 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 of multilingualism? Uh, the budget, you know, uh, 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 in my experience uh, uh, in government, when we, 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 we talk about multilingualism, we encounter a, 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 a challenge of the leadership of the department, always a, 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 a finding an excuse of the budget, saying that there are no resources, there's no budget. It's a matter of priority. Resources are there. If we can prioritize and ensure that this goal of multilingualism is achieved, we will achieve. We have sufficient resources, in my view, but it's a matter of prioritizing the budget. And therefore, in, in summary of this question, we will let I will I 
now will ensure that you know we persuade the authorities in universities, in government, to budget and prioritize, you know, multilingualism. Research in universities, in, 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 in the field of education. Education. I will persuade the Department of Education to work closely with Pensa and ensure that education also is multilingual, recognizes multilingualism. The policy. We have to review the policies now. Because our policies, you know, uh, uh, when we started, our policies would say, may, 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 we may do this, we may do this, you may do Now we find that the authorities, the decision makers, hide behind the men. The policies must be must now. We have reached a point where the policies must be must and so on. They have to be peremptory and, 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 and. and and, and everybody must be expected to comply. Uh, the language unit from the level of municipalities, we must have language units, you know, that are promoting multilingualism. Documents that are read by the rural communities who don't understand English are in English. How are they going to access information? And, and so on and so on. In a nutshell, that's how I can respond to the question of the Honorable Member. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. The next honorable member who's going to ask question to you, Doctor, is Honorable uh, Van Dijk. Thank you, Chairperson. Question three. Section 6.4 of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa empowers government, both national and provincial, to regulate and monitor the use of official languages to ensure that they enjoy parity of esteem and are treated equitably. What legal and operational measures would you put in place to make this uh, to come into effect? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Honorable member, as I have indicated, the country in terms of state planning has covered a lot of ground. In the four provinces, we have access Language Act. Nationally, the Department of Sports, Arts, uh, Arts and Culture has an act, you know, um, you, the Department of Higher Education and Training has a policy that was promulgated in 2020. The Department of Education also has an, 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 an act that, that promotes multilingualism in education, language in education. Uh, no, it's, it's a policy, not an act, you know. And the provinces, almost all of them, you know, flowing from the Constitution to the National Act and so on, they have, you know, that promotes a multilingualism. And therefore, in my view, in terms of status planning, we have policies we have and so on, but the problem is at implementation, at compliance. You know, the provinces, the municipalities, and so on, don't comply. Academic institutions also have these policies, these documents, in black and white, but it's implementation that is what is failing. And therefore, ma'am, what I would uh, recommend strongly is that we invoke Section 11 in the 1990 uh, 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 Pantal Act, Pantal Act in the amendment of 1999, 10, you know, uh, section 10, you know, and then so that we, we, we monitor and evaluate. We have to monitor. I think this term has to focus on monitoring and evaluation, you know, monitoring and evaluation. And furthermore, this term should focus on enforcing compliance you know, with the pieces of, many pieces of legislation that are there. Um, uh, compliance with the pieces of legislation, compliance with the constitution of the country. That, that, that's my input. Uh, I'm, I'm trying not to be very long. Thank you, Honorable Member. Thank you, Doc. Uh, the next uh, Honorable Member, Honorable Malomane, is going to ask question to you, Doc. 
Good morning to you, Dr. Mona. Morning, honorable member. My question, it will be based on a publication from Stats SA. Is following the publication of the language statistics released by Stats SA for the census 2022, Penslab has expressed some concerns about the sharp decline in the South African Sign Language. This is significant as South African Sign Language is now recognized as an official language. Additionally, Penslap highlighted the decrease in the number of Isindebele speakers in schools and noted that the metric class of 2022 marked the first class without a single, without a single learner registered to learn Siswati in the Gauteng province. The proportion of English, Shitsonga, and Shivrenda speakers have remained relatively stable. However, the statistics shows a decrease in the number of Africans and Isikosa speakers and a decline in the use of Khoi and Sen languages. What is your analysis of this situation? And if you were to be appointed to pencil up, what measures will you put in place to ensure that indigenous languages grow and how will it, you strengthen the languages? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. Honorable Member, my experience in this area is that uh, we have, we still have a challenge of capacity. We still have a challenge of capacity. Uh, I have worked with all the provinces. We would have meetings at national level where we meet as the directors, you know, of, of, of art, culture, and heritage. You would observe that the, the level of, of development is not the same in the province. And the challenge has been the capacity in the province. As you know, the distribution of universities in our country, you know, you'll find that in the universities in the Eastern Cape and Gauteng area, that's where, and, 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 and West, can I say, the Western Cape, that's where we have so many of these universities and cases. But in some areas, you know, you do, we don't have these academic institutions institution, you know, that train language practitioners in the indigenous languages of that area. I think that also is a contribution. I'm not sure about it in Debele, but I would ask, request the honorable member to also look at this reality. It might be that in that area, you know, we don't have a strong focus in the academic institutions on the, on the, on the language. And that makes it difficult now for that area to have language practitioners and activists that are promoting the language, preserving, conserving it. Also, in terms of structures and, and, and institutions and so on and so on. Um, with, 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 with Africans, I, I think... Uh, I, 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 I think with Africans... Uh, there are also uh, challenges in the sense that some of our academic uh, institutions are now uh, uh, deciding on bilingualism and not multilingualism, which means they, 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 they decide to phase out Africans. I won't mention the names of the universities, but in some universities, Africans is being phased out. That will contribute definitely to, to the output of, of skills and capacity, you know, in the area of, 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 of Africa. The Khoi and the San languages, the issue of capacity is strong there because, as we are aware, these universities, these, these, these um, languages are not taught in the universities. And therefore, we have to capacitate as far as the universities, you know, and train more, more, more teachers, train more educators in the area of the Khoi and the San languages. Universities, we must fund them to do research in this area because the research is key 
see without the research, you know, and so on, we will ne- not a- be able to move forward. Let's strengthen the uh, academic institutions in the area of capacity building, in the area of research, and so on. The Department of Education, Pantal must work closely with the Department of Education. I know that there's a strong relationship between Pantal and the Department of Education, but more work must be done. Uh, in the provinces and so on, you know, so that education in schools and the quality of education in African languages is improved. I have concerns now with the quality of education in, in African language. You know, uh, I'm at a university, I'm teaching students now uh, 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 language acquisition, I'm teaching them uh, uh, course. But you can see that the quality these days of the students who come from high school is not what it was during our time, you know. And therefore, these issues must be addressed, you know, with this Department of Education, uh, with, 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 with government, the Department of Arts, uh, Arts, Arts, Arts and Culture, Sports Arts and Culture, the Department of Education, DHET as well. You know, there must be this conversation that we must improve the quality, the quality of students, you know, because in language, you you develop interest in language at an early stage, you know, at primary school, you can see that this is going to be a poet. This is going to be an oral poet. This person is interested in languages, good in languages, you know. So we must have this, uh, uh, can I say, this talent nurtured, developed at an early stage. Uh, this is my input uh, at, at, at this stage. I, 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 I have not studied the report, and I would not uh, gain say what the findings are. You know, I would not uh, uh, oppose and so on. I would not support, but I'm interested in, 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 in researching and trying to understand why the cause, the root cause of this challenge. But I argue that it might be in the problem of capacity in those areas and in the problem of research done in those languages, uh, availability of resources, availability of books and so on and so on. These days, you know, our kids, you know, are more on technology. We have to move swiftly into, into technology, swiftly into technology in our development and promotion of indigenous language so that the kids are interested. They want to use their gadgets, you know, in, 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 in learning these things. That's what we are trying to do now, currently, you know, uh, to attract the interest of the, of the young people in languages. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Doc. Uh, the last uh, honorable member, uh, the last question to be raised to you, Doc, is honorable, the Chief Lutuli. I thank you. Morning, Doc. Morning. What role can the language awareness campaigns play in in the promotion of the multilingualism and the development of the sign language board? I think. Thank you very. Thank you very much, Chief uh, Tutuli. Um. Uh, Language awareness is, is very, very critical. Uh, it's, it's very, very critical, you know, to, to ensure that everybody is aware. We cannot uh, 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 confidently say that each and every citizen in the country is aware of his or her, you know, rights, language rights. Because many of, the, of these documents that have been developed are in the are in English. The, the rural community, you know, the, 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 does not have access to information. There's a lot of work that has to be done to, to, to mobilize people, to, 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 to make them aware uh, of their language rights, that they have a right to be addressed in their own languages, in offices, in hospitals, in banks and so on and so on. This thing with your eyes, but at a practical 
level, nothing is happening. Uh, language awareness will always be irrelevant. You know, will always be relevant. We have to make people aware of their language rights in radio, in television, and so on. And let's seize the opportunity. I've talked about uh, a technology. The youth of today, we must get there and make them aware of the importance of their languages. In the universities these days, there are topics about the decolonization of Asia. There's no decolonization without uh, addressing the issue of development of indigenous languages and respect for indigenous language and use of indigenous language. It's those issues that we have to emphasize and be practical about. That's why I am saying, Honorable Chief, that this, this term must focus on monitoring and evaluation, ensuring that these things are happening. You know, we are not, we, we must not just be vocal about these and, and, and talk about these, you know. We must ensure that there's practical implementation of the many policy documents of this country. The sign language, also, you know, we have elevated this, the status of sign language. It's now uh, one, uh, the twelfth language of the country. But practically, not much is happening. Why? Because what I have alluded to, the issue of capacity is there. There are few people who have the capacity to develop sign language and to teach sign language and to ensure that sign language is used. You know, there are few translators, you know, they are in these activities. You can look at government activities. Few government activities have a, a sign language interpreter. How can we argue that we are promoting the sign language? So my argument is that now we have to be practical about things. We have to implement the policies and ensure that we take action against any person who resists implementation of the policy implementation of the constitution of the country. Uh, and therefore, uh, in a nutshell, uh, I can say there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of language awareness. Uh, uh, and it will never end the importance of, of language. But it must go hand in hand with this monitoring and evaluation and ensuring that the implementation Are you done, Doc? Uh, I hope I have answered your question, Honorable Member. Thank, thank you so much, Doc. Honorable Members, do any member want to ask a question? Honorable uh, Joseph? Thank you, um, Chairperson, and good morning, Doc. Uh, you made a lot of reference uh, about the policy in the earlier questions, and now at the end, you made a lot of reference about the implementation. If you if you are successful on the board, uh, Doc, what would you focus on advice to the board? Is it about the reviewing the policy itself, or is it about the implementation of the programs that maybe is not that strong in your view? Thank you, um, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Joseph. Doc? Honorable Joseph, uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, Honorable, because I have been involved in these processes, I don't want to deny this, uh, of developing these policies and these uh, legal instruments, I have been part, and I'm familiar with all of them, you know. I think they are sufficient of ensuring that we move forward. You know, if we focus on always thinking about amendments and, uh, and, and and thinking about reviews and so on, we will never. Okay, Doc. Thank you so much, Doc. We come to an end of the questions. Uh, we are taking this time uh, to say thank you. Uh, to you, as well as seeing you that you were driving, maybe you were having other commitments, but because we have got a passionate about this pencil up, 
uh, you made a time that you must stop as we've seen you stopping the car. Uh, uh, thank you so much for wishing you the best. Uh, do you want to say something to, to these honorable members, Doc? I thank you. Doc? Um, uh, maybe Udok uh, has got that challenge, but uh, to you, honorable members and listeners, Doc, Doc has answered all the questions, even the follow-up question. Uh, Doc? Dr. Mona? Dr. Mona? Uh, I'm suspecting honorable members. Uh, uh, he missed uh, us whilst he has finished and we all ask questions and follow up questions. In that point now, uh, we are releasing Udok. We'll take the next uh, candidate. I thank you. Miss Mapono Pono, are you on the? Oh, <laughs> yes, I'm here. <laughs> okay, uh, can can yeah, we do see you. Uh, if you are having challenges of in network. Uh, goes on, you can switch off, but if we are fine, we have we do see you. Um, Miss Mapono Pono, you are here in the parliament of South Africa, uh, with the members of the portfolio committee of sport, arts, and culture, uh, and then the all administrators of this parliament, uh, the interpreters are with us, uh, researchers, content advisors, our doctors, our doctor is with us monitoring our process. So I'm um, Beauty Lulane, the chairperson of a portfolio committee. We are taking this opportunity to welcome you, uh, hoping that uh, you are your good self uh, because uh, we want you to be just free uh, when uh, honorable members asking the questions to you. And um, now uh, we have uh, five minutes of telling us who you are, but you must not forget that we have uh, your CVs with us, but uh, it's in order that we can ask you that briefly tell us uh, who is this uh, beautiful lady in front of us. Uh, but in all, you have got 45 minutes, 
but for introducing yourself, you can take less than that five minutes or you can not exceed that five minutes in order that when asking your questions, you must be within your, your, your limit of your time. Thank you so much uh, to you now. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, my name is Nalete Makonopono. I'm 31 years old. Um, I, I'm born and raised in the Western Cape province in Cape Town. Um, I grew up in a township called Kailicha and moved to another township called West Lake here in Cape Town. Um, I will be brief because I only have five minutes and you do have my CV in front of you. So I'll start uh, where I studied. I studied at the University of Cape Town a Bachelor of Social Science, majoring in Sociology, Public Policy and Administration, and Issa Kosa Language and Literature Studies. I then did an honors degree in African languages, where my research was focused on language policy implementation in basic education. I then did a master's degree at the University of Cape Town, where I focused my study further on the implementation of language policies in basic education. I am currently a PhD candidate, a final year PhD candidate at the University of Cape Town, majoring in African languages. And my study is now focused on the implementation of language policies in higher education institutions. During this time, I became a teacher, though I did not study to be a teacher, but my research was focused in education. So I wanted to conduct ethnographic research, which is research where you, the person who was doing the research, is immersed within your study. So I became a teacher. So to date, I've taught from grade R, grade 12, teaching is a Kosa first additional language. So I've taught in all phases of the basic education system, and I also moved to become a lecturer. So I've lectured students in is a Kosa in, first, in home language acquisition, and also in second language acquisition. So uh, my lecturing experience is quite extensive from the University of Cape Town to private institutions such as the South African College of Applied Psychology. I've also done adult basic education and training as a lecturer for um, adult learners. I also have a company called Inguenguese Language Services. Where I provide language services. I started the company based on uh, finding solutions for African language speakers. Uh, so institutions such as banks and Parliament of South Africa, they also procure the services from me. I provide interpreting translation, inter uh, editing, and all range of language uh, services to the South African population. And my biggest project I've done is to host the BRICS Summit, which I provided the interpreters for all the international language which were required. Um, I'm currently a curriculum development specialist at Cura Holdings, one of the big private school groups in South Africa, where I'm in charge of the Isikosa curriculum for the entire Cura group. Um, I think we'll end there with my introduction since you have my CV in front of me. Thank you so much, Chairperson. Thank you so much, Naledi. Uh, Naledi, now, uh, honorable members are going to ask you some questions. And the, the first honorable member uh, who's going to ask question to you is Honorable Zondi. Honorable Zondi. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Chair. And good morning to... Miss Mapono Pono. And here's your first question. What is your understanding of linguistic human rights and its linkages to linguistic diversity and multilingualism? Why would it be important for you to argue for multilingualism in South Africa? Yeah, Thank you, uh, uh, Honorable Zondi. And now uh, to you. And thank you, Honorable Teto, for the question. Uh, this question speaks directly to the work I'm doing and my research uh, interests. Um, in my research interests, interest, I was very interested in the implementation of language policies in basic education because I think in my opinion that fundamentally for South Africans to understand their language rights, then everything for me starts at school, in the schooling system. Because as a young child, this is where you develop attitudes and beliefs about different things in society. 
So part of developing a positive uh, attitude towards your own language and other languages in society, for me, starts at school. So a, a child may not comprehend what a right is at their age, let's say uh, at six years old or five years old. But how that language is presented to them helps them to develop an attitude towards their language and other languages in the society. As such, it is then important that a, 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 the language rights in South Africa, given the history of our country, they are emphasized through how we deliver the teaching and learning of African languages in schools. For us to get to multilingualism and for us to appreciate it as something that is positive for our society, it starts at how this process is being conducted from, from the onset. So, for instance, uh, Sapir and Wolf hypothesis talks about how a person's framework or how they view the world is based on what language they speak. And they make examples of, for example, if you grew up in Antarctica, you would know over 100 names for ice because your context speaks of ice. You know, you live in an, in an environment which is full of ice. So obviously, your language will have a strong emphasis on the types of ice, which ones you can use to build your house and so on. So it means that when you speak another person's language, you actually enter into their worldview. So you start to understand how that person reasons and how that person view the world, views the world through their language. Also with teaching and learning, learning in your own language is a very important aspect of acquiring knowledge because you use the tools within your own language to try and understand the concepts which are being taught to you. Example, mathematics. If it is taught in a foreign language that you do not understand as your home language, it becomes difficult for you to make the linkages between that concept and what you are learning because even that language itself is far removed from your particular circumstances. As such, it is then important that in South Africa, while it is emphasized that we do have language rights as per the constitution, but this is further emphasizing how we do things how we deliver African languages, and also that learners know from a young age that their languages are also the same and equal as other languages. So language rights to me are very important, and the constitution and all the other legislation in our country emphasizes them and gives them to us. But the problem lies in how we further implement them and monitor and evaluate that what is said on paper is actually happening. So multilingualism is the core in this country because we come from a sort of past of injustices and where language was used to oppress others and where other languages were actually diminished as how the constitution refers to them as privacy diminished. So they were actually being deleted, being uh, made sure that they don't exist in our society and were not recognized. So in our country, it's a very important aspect that we, 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 we reinforce the rights part, but we also make sure that the actual work that is written down translates so that we may have a multilingual society. The case I'm making is that in South Africa, we don't have a choice. We need to have a multilingual society. We are a very diverse society with different languages. So we must embrace multilingualism because it's part of in social cohesion, but also ensuring that all language speakers have their rights respected and all children in South Africa have access to education in their own mother. Thank you, Honourable. Thank you, Naledi. Uh, the next Honourable Member, Honourable Adams. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Chairperson. And good morning to Ms. Uh, Mano Pono. Pono. Uh, my question will be Section 6.2 uh, six of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa acknowledges that indigenous languages are facing a challenge of diminishing and thus, thus require the state to take practical steps and positive measures to de evaluate, evaluate uh, the status and advance the use of these languages. What is your opinion on this section? What measures would you put in place to ensure that the state including provinces and municipalities, comply fully with the constitutional requirement. I thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, Honorable, for the question. And much of my research actually focuses on this aspect of the Constitution. Much of the critic among scholars is that um, we have the necessary laws, like the section which you are mentioning, which empowers uh, provinces and, uh, and, and, and the national government to safeguard previously diminished languages in our country. But this, the, this, this criticism among scholars is that the language used is easy for those provinces or even national governments and other entities of the state and schools and so on to deviate because it gives them options to do so. It says even within that section that uh, while this is being done, while previously diminished languages, there must be steps taken so that they may be empowered because they are previously disempowered, which make them previously diminished languages. With that said, the section goes on to say it must look into the practicality uh, that, uh, so meaning that government departments must assess to what extent is it practical to implement a, a language policy, for example. It also says the expense involved must also be evaluated. So it gives leeway for a department, a government entity, to say, oh, practically we can't we can't achieve this because of ABC, or this will cost us too much money, therefore we won't be able to implement. So while the law is there and that section is good and well, it does give a leeway for government departments and entities to to, to deviate and, and, and express because the, the, the section itself gives them that opportunity to do so. So this is where now you come in as the lawmakers in parliament to say, what powers do you give a, a pens out to be able to enforce such measures? And also how, what powers to monitor and evaluate one pens out does do that work? What are the repercussions when such is not implemented? Because the key in what I find is that there are no strong monitoring and evaluation systems, nor are there repercussions what is going to happen if nothing is going to happen then why must the department be forced to do so because they know no repercussions are going to happen so this is where we need to sit together with the department to bring a bill into effect that comprises of a empowering pencil to have measures to hold the departments to account everything says we may 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 we may do this we may but there is nothing that says, if this doesn't happen, these are the repercussions for the department. With that said, we're still going to see this section being deviated from. And the previously diminished languages not actually upgrading in status because there are clauses within the constitution that allow this deviation. So it needs, the, the pencil needs to be empowered to give repercussions. If the repercussions are punitive in nature, then so be it. But there must be consequences for failing to uplift previously diminished languages within a province or a national department, uh, a national department or a national entity or whatever the case may be. That would be my answer to that question, Honourable. Thank you, Naledi. Uh, the next Honourable Member is Honourable Van Dijk, who must ask question to you, uh, Naledi. Thank you, Chairperson. Good morning, Ms. Mana Mapono Pono. My question is as follows. Um, Section 6.4 of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa empowers government, both the national and provincial, to regulate and monitor the use of official languages to ensure that uh, they enjoy parity of esteem and are treated equitably. What legal and operational measures would you put in place to make this to come into effect. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable. And I'm going to sound like a stack record with the uh, laws, the implementation, and the repercussions thereof. Because that section, again, it gives us the, it gives us what must happen. But again, it states that their departments and the national government must look into the reasonableness, the expense, the regional circumstances and balance the needs of the population. And it says, must use at least two official languages. 
So it does not say they directly that of these two official languages, one must be a, a, a previously diminished language. For me, that is legal empowerment to put that clause directly there. If it's open ended like this, any entity can choose any two languages and they are within the law of South Africa because that's what it says. So you, Parliament, must assist us as PENSAF and empower us and to, and we as a, a PENSAF must lobby the department to introduce, introduce uh, amendments to the bill to say of these two official languages that we can use, one of them must be the previously diminished one. That's when we will start to see a change in previously diminished languages, getting the parity of esteem as the English and Africans, which were the only two official languages of South Africa during apartheid and colonial times. So to me, it is the law that must empower the board to have a explicit clause that says a previously diminished language must be used. Then if it's not, we then put in the measures of what happens if you don't do it. Then we're moving somewhere. That would be my answer. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Mapono Pono. Uh, with that answer, the next honorable member is Honorable Malomane. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Greetings to you, Ms. Mapono Pono. My question will be, what are the key arguments expounded by the National Language Policy Framework and enforced by the use of Official Language Act number 12 of 2012 in relation to language use? Have you identified any gaps between language policy and its implementation? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable. That is the core of my research, though I am focused on education on the education sector. There are many gaps between what is written uh, and what is being implemented. And further, how is what being written being monitored and evaluated? It's all good and well for the state to have the constitution, all good and well to have the national language policy framework, all good and well to have the education act, which speaks about uh, the use of languages. Uh, all good and well to have all these policies, the incremental uh, approach to introduction of African languages in schools, the uh, higher education uh, policy on the use of languages in higher education, all good and well. All these laws are so good and beautifully written. The problem is the implementation and monitoring thereof. It's all good and well to put it on paper. But if what you put on paper does not translate to what you have intended in the policy, and then you do not evaluate and come up with what are the problems at the implementation stage of this policy so that you diagnose them and provide possible solutions for that not to happen as the policies continue to happen, we are going to continue to have this particular issue. So there is a big gap between what is written and what is implemented because each and every, uh, particularly in my area of study in the education sector, because all of these entities and departments get their core mandate from the national language, from the constitution, then the national language policy framework, and then come down to their own particular fields like the National Schools Act and so on. So. With that said, it means that the national policy framework is broad enough for each government entity, a government institution, and all higher education institutions to actually implement the national language policy framework. But it does not then come back and say, uh, we have the policy states, you must implement it in this manner. And now they don't come back to evaluate what is happening. I'll make an example in the education sector. Uh, all schools must have a language policy as per the National Schools Act. You get to a school, they do have a language policy. In my uh, particular study for my master's, where at the school where I was teaching, there is a policy and it says they are offering three languages, Isikosa, Africans, and English. Uh, I was the Isikosa teacher, but the policy says that, right? But what was happening 
qualitatively is that it's a course compared to the other languages was only being taught for 30 seconds, 30 minutes, once a week. Compared to English and Africans, which have been taught for five hours and four hours a week. Now, the policy is saying there is is a course, and the, the department, if they see the policy, they tick the box, which the policy is there. But they don't check what is happening qualitatively because if we are to check qualitatively, it means that this course has not been taught at this school because there's no learner who can acquire a course who is being taught a course for 30 minutes once a week. It's not possible under any circumstances. So, and also if you contrast with the other languages, why are the others given so much time and what is the performance in life later in those languages for those learners? It means that they are fully equipped for those languages. If they're getting English and Africans for four hours and five and four hours a week, respectively, for four days a week, that means they are they are empowered. So it then means that the the the, the implementation must be monitored. It is not going to assist us to just say there is a policy and tick a box. There is a national language policy framework, yes, but what is happening qualitatively beyond the language policy? How is it being implemented and what are the repercussions thereof? That would be the answer to my question. Thank you to the question. Hi, thank you, Naledi. Um, the next honorable member to ask the question is Chief Lutuli. To you, Mshigas. Thank you, Chair. Uh, what role can language awareness campaign play in the promotion of the multilingualism and the development of the sign language, I think. Thank you, Honorable. Um, I think that uh, multilingualism uh, and language campaigns will go hand in hand, particularly in our country, in the context of South Africa, where we have such a sordid past when it comes to languages. Um, and it's sordid because languages are part of a person's identity, how they express themselves and how they view the world. So, and because of that, we face, a, not only is the, 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 the language issue in South Africa a, a, a social one, but it's also a Political one because political statements uh, uh, were made when other languages were were diminished uh, during apartheid and colonial times. And I like to emphasize this because it's the reason we find ourselves where we are. So in in the context of our country, then we cannot also assume that even mother tongue speakers of their own languages are actually aware of their own languages. And you find this a lot in our sector in education, where you know because of the history we have. We have uh, learners that have attitudes towards their own mother tongue, which becomes difficult for you as a teacher to start teaching that child their own mother tongue. All of these things uh, uh, relate to the type of history that we have when it comes to language in our country. And so because we want to achieve social cohesion in our country, I believe language is the strongest tool we can do that. Because without doing anything, you must use language. You can't be an accountant, you can't be a, a doctor, you can't be anything if you if you are not using the language. So language awareness campaigns are very important. And as we live in a society where people who live with disabilities are often discarded or sidelined, it becomes very important for us as linguists to also be active in making means for sign language to be uh, for all people in South Africa to be aware of sign language and to know at least basic signs to, to greet a person uh, who, who, who speaks sign language. And it's a very important milestone in our country that sign language is now one of the official languages. So I would say the language uh, 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 campaigns are very critical in our country, which PENSAB needs to drive even wider um, because language can be a source of conflict, yes, but we can also use it to be a source of cohesion 
for people to understand one another. This is what we need in our country after such a difficult past. We also need to, with that, with the campaigns must be coupled with research, particularly when it comes to sign language. I think many of us who do not use sign language regularly are quite oblivious to what sign language is, where does it come from, things like that. So to be aware of it, because it will show that our society is not ableist in nature, but it's a society where all languages are respected equally. And sign language needs to be that language where in every school, in every uh, education institution, at least there must be intro uh, classes for people to learn just to greet a person who uses sign language and must have diverse classrooms where we have students in higher education sectors who use sign language so that it becomes a norm and we do not only focus on uh, us who use spoken language while sign language also exists. So I would think that for us to achieve multilingualism in our country, we need to be aware of the languages and respect them. And then we can be able to achieve a multilingual society. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Naledi. Uh, another young, young woman. Uh, honorable members, is there any member who want to uh, to uh, uh, ask any question? Uh, so far, uh, Ms. Mapono Pono, honorable members are happy about their questions uh, to ask. Let me take this opportunity to say thank you so much uh, for your time and uh, for your interest to become uh, amongst those who can be uh, in this Pants Lab in order that uh, the proposals and the amendments, uh, which some of you, you just propose, must be looked at. Uh, uh, if now you want to say something, uh, this is your opportunity to do so. Thank you, thank you so much. Thanks, Chair. I would just like to say thank you so much for the opportunity as a young person in South Africa who is a language activist. I feel very honored to have been called upon as a shortlisted candidate of the Pan-African Language Board of South Africa. It's been part of my career plans and goals to one day sit on this board. So I didn't know that at 31 years old, I would already be called to sit on the board. I've been working very hard fighting for uh, language rights uh, for um, African language speakers in South Africa. Um, so thank you very much. I feel very honored that you recognized my work and called me to come and present my case to you. Thank you. Uh, before uh, you are leaving, <laughs> uh, uh, we have an honorable member whom we excused himself uh, to be in the virtual, virtual platform. I uh, uh, wanted to raise a question. We are sorry about that. I've just seen now uh, on the screen. Uh, Honorable Mtetwa, we are sorry about that, Honorable Mtetwa. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Um, I was avoiding the temptation. It's not a question. I just want to commend the lady. You know, when, when I see young people at the age of 31, she's where she is. I get so encouraged and I feel that our country still has a hope for a better future. I commend and I hope and I pray and I wish that you make it to the board. All the best, my dear. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable uh, Mtedwa. Uh, I'm suspecting uh, Honorable members, we have done this in another young lions yesterday. Uh, it's very encouraging that uh, honorable members, they do notice uh, whatever they are noticing through our uh, candidates. Uh, we do accept what we are saying. Uh, Naledi? Yes, Chair. 
No, I just, I, I, I want to say thank you to the honorable member. Uh, as I said, I'm really touched that I was called upon you and I will continue doing the work, uh, even if it's outside of the board, should I not make it? It's basically my life, this uh, language work. So thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Now we are released. Thank you so much. Thank you. Honorable members, uh, now we are going to uh, call Rosa. Please, 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 don't disturb me, honorable members, and my secretary next to me. <laughs> Talk to me. You can ask questions. You are allowed. I must not sing you talking. I'm not sure what you are talking about. I can assist you. <laughs> um, honorable members, uh, uh, we have a uh, Gavin and Koliswa who are going to assist us. Uh, now we are coming uh, to Ngesikosa Ufutondwaba, where we are having a sign language candidate, and I'm suspecting we are all happy about that. That at least uh, uh, this question, ye ye panslap in the language, uh, we have one. So, Miss Go Gavin, so from six hundred voted. Gavin, and uh, yeah, I see. Morning, Claire. Yes, 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 Gavin. Um, I'm hope I'm audible so that uh, this can do to make sure that we are understanding the candidates as they are being presented, Chair. So, yeah, hundred percent. Okay, uh, thank you, Chair. I just want to inform the uh, committee that I'll be working alone. Unfortunately, my, my, my co-interpreter, Koliswa, uh, is not well. So I'll be working alone for the session while you interview uh, the candidates. Accepted. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, now, uh, Gavin, we are taking this opportunity to welcome uh, a candidate, Urasi Bobe, and now that uh, must introduce uh, herself. I thank you. Hello, good morning, everybody. Um... I, I, and also the people who are watching at home, thank you very much for Parliament for allowing me to apply and be shortlisted for the interview. Uh, I am uh, Bontle Biapo, Biapie. Okay, I'm from Joburg. I work full time at Wits University. Uh, where I'm involved with sign language research um and application uh i also teach uh, students south african sign language um i've been doing this for many years and i think that should be enough of an introduction for now um i i i'm ready to answer questions and happy to do so thank you so much um uh thank you Bonte, beautiful lady, um, you are having uh, your 45 minutes uh, to answer the questions. The first question is going to be uh, asked by Honorable Zondi. Thank you. Thank you uh, and good morning. 
Uh, the, the first question will be, what is your understanding of linguistic human rights and its linkages to linguistic diversity? Sorry, sorry, sorry to interrupt, Chair. Sorry. Yes, yes. Um, it would it be possible for me to see the face of the honourable member? It's a cameraman. Uh, can you assist? There he is. Uh, okay, yes, I can see now. Thank you very much. <laughs> it was you. the camera that didn't show uh, our member. Oh. Yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. No problem. Honorable zone. Okay. Thank you, Chair. I said the first question will be, what is your understanding of linguistic human rights and its linkages to linguistic diversity and multilingualism? Why would it be important for you to argue for multilingualism in South Africa? Diabo. Thank you. Okay. Here in South Africa, we have uh, many, many languages. Uh, it's now 13, it used to be 12, now it's 13 languages that, 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 that South Africa is involved with. I'm happy that this is being expanded so much. Um, it is also very important to support all these languages in South Africa especially the uh, specific languages we use and make sure that they are all up, raised up to a, a specific standard. Um, there's spoken languages as well as sign language now, which is recognized. Um, unfortunately, they are all on different levels within their development. Um, and we need to ensure that in terms of different ways, especially in linguistically, um, that they are all brought to the same standard. Uh, a lot of languages have their own different phonologies, uh, specifically spoken languages, which have spe specific terms which are heard in, in, in a way, while you have uh, sign language phonologies and also their their different principles um, to ins things such as their hand shapes, uh, their placements, as well as uh, their facial expression and movements, um, as well as their orientation. While spoken languages and sign languages are different, uh, each each have their own place, and it is very important that the pencil board have people who who have studied and understand the differences between them. Um, although there are some languages who who are still at a basic level, we are we need to grow those languages and make sure that we can see which ones are on are needing of protection as well as development and improve the way that they, they are standardized. We can encourage research within those different areas, which is important, and make sure that there is no linguistical di discrimination uh, and ensure that multilingualism in terms of languages are encouraged and in make sure again once again that no language is oppressed um we all know that that in terms of english there there's you can be used on an academic level whilst sign language um is not broadly used as well as english it is very important that we are made aware of all these different languages and sure that each language is accepted and treated fairly uh, within South Africa. 
we have a beautiful land with beautiful people in it. And that is why South Africa needs to ensure that all are, create, are, are equal and fair, especially when it comes to language and protect uh, those languages to make sure that they are all of a similar standard. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Butler. Uh, can I now call the next honorable uh, member, Honorable Adams? Thank you, Honorable Chairperson, and good morning to Ms. Uh, Raseboye. My question to you, um, uh, uh, Ms. Bontle, Section 62 of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa acknowledges the indigenous languages are facing a challenges of demissing, and this requires the state to take practical steps and positive measures to elevate their status and advance the use of these languages. What is your opinion on this section? What measures would you put in place to ensure that the state, including provinces and municipalities, comply fully with this constitutional requirement? I thank you. To you, Kevin. Okay. Indigenous languages. Uh, are fundamental in their own way. I mean, they have a history and a comparative past. Um, when people perceive these, they diff that these indigenous languages differently, but they are very rich and detailed, com complex languages. And what we need to understand or question is to make sure that society is influenced in the way that these languages are now seen in terms of indigenous language to the way they so that their past is is also comprehended um there's been a lot of research and fi research findings collected regarding these indigenous languages. These, these, this research and findings must be used to develop and ensure that these languages are known to the South African people and ensure that they are not, sorry, I just interpreted a clarification, D. Okay, um, so it's okay, yes. Okay, we need to make sure that these, these languages uh, are not, um, Dissolve. Example, if we look at sign language, sign language is the language of deaf people uh, throughout generations. Um, where you'll have hearing people who try and change the language themselves or uh, at least try and understand their lang the language themselves. Um, that further does spread the language in terms of sign language. We need, but it is not the, the, the total strength of the language. It's the same it can be seen for indigenous languages. We need to preserve that language and have more people participating in the language and doing research in that language, specifically at a tertiary education level. 
that we could there there needs to be a focus on those languages within South Africa and make sure that they are not uh, dis, um lost in terms of South Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Butler. The next honorable member uh, on the list to uh, ask the question uh, is Honorable Van Dijk. Thank you, Chair. My question is as follows. Section 6.4 of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa empowers government, both the national and provincial, to regulate and monitor the use of official languages to ensure that they enjoy parity of esteem and are treated equitably. What legal and operational measures would you put in place to make this to come into effect? Thank you. Hmm. Thank you very much for the question, Honourable Member. Um, if I look at the different uh, strategies as well as policies. Sorry, my video has just gotten stuck. I'm sorry, this is the interpreter. My video got stuck. Okay, if I look at the different strategies as well as the planning and implementation. Especially uh, if we look if we look at the, the act from Act twenty twenty from two thousand and five, if we look there, I can see how these different policies and strategies could be achieved as well as language development. That's the first thing. Secondly, research um, can be done in terms of, of language to uh, gather different evidence. 100% how, I, I would still need to, to check those things. But we can use different policy as well as guidelines to ensure that we achieve our objectives. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin and Butle. The next honorable uh, member is Honorable Malomani. Thank you, Chairperson. Greetings to you, Ms. Rasibupse. Uh, Chair, my question to Butle, it will be, what are the key arguments expounded by the national language policy framework and enforced by the use of official languages act which is act number 12 of 2012 in relation to language use have you identified any gaps between the language policy and implementation Hmm. Thank you very much for the question, honourable member. If I if I look at the national plan and policy, I must be honest. I don't know the policy that well, um, and I would not want to th uh, uh, thumb suck and answer out for you. I'd rather be honest and say I am not well versed in that policy. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Gavin and Butler. Uh, the Honorable Chief Lutuli. <clears throat> thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, what role can language awareness campaign play in the promotion of the multi multilingualism and the development of the sign language 
I think. Currently, technology is improving at a rapid rate. At the moment, technology such as AI, artificial intelligence, we believe that AI could benefit us all. But that is the big question. Because we know that AI technology has its own limitations as well as its own challenges. Um, and also we know that every person's voice is not the same. Which means that AI does have gaps within it itself. And that is a challenge. The same can be said for language we need to expand access to language and ensure um, that spaces such as TV as well as media uh, make it an option for people to access different languages. The TV broadcasters must ensure that all different kinds of language are accessible For example, a person who watches TV, they might be able to have captioning within Corsa, is it Corsa, um, which can help them learn and improve their, their Corsa language. But unfortunately, South Africa doesn't have captioning within uh, Corsa at the moment. So I feel that we need to make sure that broader access of language is made available, especially in spaces, spaces such as TV networks and, and broadcasts. And we need to ensure that, that the people generally do have access. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bursa. Uh, May I ask uh, uh, from the members whether you still have uh, some questions? Uh, thank you, Gavin, uh, for your work. Thank you, uh, Butle. Let's take this opportunity to thank you, uh, thinking that uh, you, you wanted to be part of South Africans no discrimination. Uh, we are happy that we are part of the candidates. We are hoping for the best, uh, hoping that uh, the results will get it from our department after we've done this process as the committee. If you want to say something, you are allowed, uh, Muntle, with pleasure. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you. Um, I want to thank you. I I have a question linked to PANSALP and their strategic plan. 2020 of 2025. I want to know if an application, is, an applicant is put forward. Um, they will they be allowed to contribute um, to to will they be allowed to contribute their opinions or any um, suggestions they have in order to make sure that the strategic plans go forward or which may benefit those strategic plans? Obviously, uh, I don't think that. Uh that a uh, proposal can't not be allowed uh, to process and forward to the relevant department, which is Department of Sport, Arts and Culture. Uh, I don't see uh, anything that can say 
it cannot be accepted, that proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Mutle. Mutle. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you very much for the opportunity that was given for me and for answering my question. Um, thank you, all of you who asked me questions. Thank you for your time and this opportunity. Thank you, you are released. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Bye-bye. Bye. Honorable members, uh, we have uh, another candidate that is going to be in. Uh, Mule Balo. Wow. Eh? Yeah, that's one. Moliban. Yeah, Moliban. Yes. Yes. Uh, that one. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we miss the tell us it is a wrong one. Moliban, yes, yes. Moliban. 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 Okay. Hey. Uh, check o o o I uh, wanted to check whether uh, Mr. Mulibalwe is in.
Mr. Uh, good day, uh, Honorable Muli Balwe. Okay. Uh, <laughs> we, we are trying to pronounce your surname correctly. You must forgive us, but we are trying our best. Um, are you in? I want to see your face. In order that I must be sure that uh, whom we are talking to. Oh, yeah, born or shall a pants. Vula can go with it or open your feet. Uh, please, uh, a mute. Okay. Uh, Okay. Uh, good, good day. Yes, yes. Uh, we now uh, we are ready to greet you. Uh, we are saying that uh, today, as this Parliament of South Africa, uh, we are sitting here. On a Saturday, uh, hoping that uh, even your good self to prioritize this uh, day uh, to come and uh, to be part of interviews. Uh, I'm the chairperson of this committee. I'm Beauty Lulan. I'm having honorable members with us, uh, those who are going to ask questions. Uh, will tell you who's a member who's asking question from you. Uh, we're having our uh, secretariat, we're having our researchers, we're having our content advisors, we're having the doctor from parliament. Uh, we are taking serious this work. Um, we don't want to undermine you. Uh, will ask you to tell who you are in five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. My name is Manfred Komozomo Lebalwa, a, a, a former or outgoing member of the Board of Pencil. And I've been involved in language matters since 1999 when I volunteered then to be a member of the provincial, voluntary member of the provincial language committee. And then on, and only in 2004, when the pencil established offices throughout the, the country in the five provinces, I'm one of the members who was pioneered to go and open up an office of pencil being the four of us, the four provinces, that's where I come from. And um, after that employment, I worked for Pencil for, as a provincial manager from 2004 until 2012 when I retired because of age. And from 2012, I've just been on my own and doing my own work, language work, advocacies and so forth, and workshops for to capacitate people who like to know about the language dispensation vis-a-vis -vis the language policies and so forth. And also do my private work, which is writing and uh, writing of books and uh, helping uh, budding authors to write till to date. So I've been a member of the board anyway, of the outgoing board. That's where I am. I haven't been a teacher for a long time. I think there's a lot around that. 
But be it as it may, that's where I come from. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you so much. Um, now we are having uh, the first honorable member. Uh, we must not forget to tell you that you're having your 45 minutes uh, to to do to answer like everyone who's coming uh, to these interviews. Uh, now, Honorable Zondi, it's your time to ask question. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Honorable uh, Chairperson, and good afternoon to Mr. Malibalwa. Your first Thank question. You. Thank the you. Mr. Question from me will be: What is your understanding of linguistic human rights and its linkage, link, linkages to linguistic diversity and multilingualism? Why would it be important for you to argue for multilingualism in South Africa? Yeah, well. Thank you, sir. If I got you correctly. Uh, linguistic human rights violations is when someone's language or own mother tongue language or a language of preference by an individual has been violated in that he's denied the chance to use his language in all spheres of life, whether it be at work, workplace, or in school, or anywhere else, or even parliament or wherever one is, one should be allowed to use the language of your preference. That's a ling if that is not done, it's a violation of that linguistic right. And now what is the extension of the question? I missed it again. There's part two of the question. Yeah, I, 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 I said, why would you be important for, the, for you to argue for multilingualism? Uh, well, multilingualism, um, I'll argue for multilingualism, which means that people are allowed to use their languages. Citizens are allowed to use their languages because it is their right, guaranteed by the Constitution. So we don't say people must talk all the languages, but people must be multilingual in that. You should be able to speak and understand more than your own uh, one language, which means you're not only going to concentrate on the language. It is better to know several of the languages, official languages of South Africa, because we are a multilingual society, which guarantees what we call linguistic tolerance. If you understand your language, you understand mine, <coughs> I'm sorry, we can then understand each other better. As it has been said before, <coughs> I'm sorry, that when you speak to someone's language, through someone's language, you are speaking to a person in his own language, like Dr. Mandela would be able to say. So that's how I would explain what multilingualism is. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Zondi. Thank you. OK, thanks. Next question from uh, Honorable Adams. Thank you uh, very much, Acting uh, Chairperson. And good morning to Mr. Mola Balo. My question will be Section 6 of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa acknowledges that indigenous languages are facing a challenge of diminishing, and this requires the state to take practical steps and positive measures to elevate their status and advance the use of these languages. What is your opinion on this section? What measures will you put in place to ensure that the state, including provinces and municipalities, comply fully with the constitutional requirements? I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. <clears throat> Indeed, as the Constitution advises, there are fast diminishing languages 
as we are aware, there are only, there's only one human being in the world. But this in the world who is able to speak, the only competent person that in the Northern Cape, uh, uh, and Katrina. So we, we are happy that a lot has happened. Uh, what Pencil has done, actually, having honored the only surviving person in the world on, with a doctorate, Dr. Katrina now. And uh, for that language, who was the only one with the only one single person, except that he herself has taught uh, 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 the family members, particularly his children. So it is indeed so that there are other languages within us uh, with many, many dialects that are fast diminishing and there are people who speak those languages and they think they've been uh, marginalized. Uh, like the Khoi and San, as you know, what is happening in Botswana and worldwide. And uh, we, we, we wish that it, it be recognized because we have a lot of people, for instance, in other provinces such as Northwest. When I was a provincial manager there, I made a lot of mess about it. And uh, unfortunately, most of the people who spoke the language then, including around Mafeking, there's a township there, there were still a lot of people remaining speaking that little, but we love them to die out. But today, I would say, also around the Freiburg area, when there are other some, at least there is a uh, provincial language committee in the Northwest that says time to see and to look and to preserve those that are still there. But not a lot has been done. I, I'm disappointed to say the when I was around Pretoria, where I now stay, I came across one person, uh, I don't know what, I forgot her name, who's coming from the Northern Cape, at least she speaks a language, I can understand, but she's able to speak in Afrikaans as well, even a bit of Saturn around the area. And I said to people around Pretoria, where I'm near them, that there is another person existing here, why don't we visit that person? And since they said I must send that trip, I did so. And she started to, I think I have it somewhere. I don't know what language you speak, but the doctor who was commissioned to make a follow up said she would be able to follow up. Now, that is one that here in, in my vicinity around Clubhouse, Pretoria, just near Mabupan, Pretoria. And ex a living, I don't know what language it is, if we could care to come and see. Here is one other language, traces, because he said he comes from the Northern Cape. And she perhaps unveil many, many more. And that doctor said as soon as she shares the clicks, she'll be able to tell exactly what, what dialect of language has been spoken by this lady. So indeed, I don't know what I can do because not, not all is my might. But I'll say uh, I'm around Pretoria because Pencil knows about it, that they'll perhaps commission their provincial manager around Kauti, or an expert on the language from Northern Cape, to come and interview this lady because she'll be able to unveil many, many others that you don't know. Uh, that's what I'll do, but as I say, we, there was a lot to be done by us in the past 30 years. And how many of such people have we learned out? And other, you know, languages such as Babedi and other things, fast diminishing languages, there are many. And uh, that's what I would ask, the look, not the local people to come up, like the one I'm, the lady I've unveiled, and follow it up and see how many, and work with the other commission, which is for protection of linguistic human rights and religious rights, to really, because it's about societies, that they must definitely also help PENSEP, or PENSEP should have to work together with them to protect those languages, because PENSEP will definitely protect individual languages but that body, which commissions for protection of linguistic rights and, and so forth, uh, uh, communities, that they must work together and unveil these people so that they could protect the, uh, the diminished and dying languages. I uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, the next honorable member is Honorable Joseph to ask the question. Thank you, um, Chairperson, and good afternoon. To Mr. Munebalawa. Good afternoon, Mr. Joseph. 
the question I will ask relates to section 64 of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa that empowers government, both national and provincial, to regulate and monitor the use of official languages to ensure that they enjoy parity and be treated equitably. What legal and operational measures would you put in place to make this to come into effect? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I think uh, uh, it is a given by the Constitution that government must take practical steps. That's what the Constitution says. We are that, I'm just talking by the word uh, parity of esteem because we don't speak of equality here. We have used that word for the past 30 years and it doesn't take us anywhere. We don't know what parity uh, esteem would mean except that all languages must be treated equally. Now, that is a corner, you know, a, a, a corner around which people just hide their faces. So, equitable. It also goes for that to say what resources allow. That's a compromise in itself about other languages. It is a right, and there should be no compromise about, about people's languages. So, what your question is what I'll, I'll do. We'll definitely do having made all the advocacy for advocacy programs for the past 30 years to really put in place structures that will do definitely through pencil that will definitely go go out of their way to make sure that these people come up to the front and be known. Because it is not pencil that will be able to litigate against people who have been violated or whose language is just getting extinct. The constitution, including pencil, says only shall the pencil accord the complainants or people whose languages have been violated resources to get recourse. Now, when it says so, if those people come up or they're aware of them, pencil can do anything about them and trust people or departments or the provinces. But those people who have got complained about the misuse or abuse or non-use of their languages will complain to Pansel registering as a linguistic violation for intervention. And courts have ruled out before that it is not Pansel that should litigate on behalf, except to give resources to those who complain. So a massive uh, uh, advocacy program should be upped by Pansel so that they can around to municipalities and tell people about their uh, linguistic rights. For instance, around Mafiki, where I work as a provincial manager, there is a, around Maho, I don't know, Maho, Stel, Shevela, uh, and think there's a place like that. The dominant residents of that place around Mafiki are people who speak South African, South, no, which are, uh, like we say, deaf people, could call it that way. But then they are forced at those clinics to, to write what their complaints are all about. So it is a violation of a linguistic human rights. And the municipality is there. Now the problem also lies here. The municipalities have very little to do in the provinces. If the law of language, like for instance, South African Sun language, which has recently been uh, passed and become the child language, Nobody can monitor implementation of that language until a province, even a municipality, has come up with a law, a customer from the national law, from uh, uh, a Yola Use of Languages Act. If they don't have that, to the level of the entire government, which is the province, or the municipality in the entire government, as municipalities, they have no basis to begin to work on. And therefore, the process of the provinces having to customize and to legitimize the national law to work for them is a long process because it takes about three years after law, the national law has been passed that the province should customize that law to their own demographics and within their own limits. And from there, after three years or so, can the law be I mean, can they get to the municipality 
which also is going to take a very long, long time to accustomize that law into that level of tough government. So as of now, it's non-existent. And when you go to Pansab, has to go and monitor there. What do you monitor? Because we have military law that exists. So it takes a long, long way. So this is a very big, big challenge. And the question is, what can I do? Not as an individual, but maybe the monitoring wing of Pansab should really have more muscle to do this and the capacity to do so. So that they make sure that the laws are passed within each province, like we have nine provinces. So there's only one, so to say. There's only one province today which has done something about this matter of language rights. And the province is Eastern Cape, which in two, two, two to three weeks ago, we are launching a bilingual education program that was highlighted also with the persons of the Monaro Minister of Education for the only province to have come up to party. Even though they have not been passed that language of the language, I mean, I mean the law of language, they have already done and come to party. And we are looking forward to see other provinces, the eight provinces following suit. Now, what a driving force has to be that is the mechanism placed by government itself. And whose government? By pencil should be what Pansel should be doing is actually to channel advice to national government, whatever government is, whether it is through the the Minister of Sport and Culture as an overseer of the very entity and other entities, or whether they should be channeled to Parliament through speaker, nobody knows. But when, whenever uh, uh, whatever happens, one of the major tasks of the board is to give advice to government. Now, maybe the problem is a, uh, 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 undefined, Mr. thank you, undefined uh, uh, yes. May I, I remind you that uh, we are still having other questions, and now uh, try to round up because we are left with 10 minutes, but there are still questions that are going to come. So try to round up this question uh, uh, we are happy that you are passionate, but uh, to each and every uh, candidate, you do have 45 minutes. I thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. I think uh, a bit as it may, uh, I, I think I made my, my point. Thank you, Chair. Hey, thank you so much. Thanks so much. Uh, the next honorable member, uh, you are left with 10 minutes. Uh, we are still members who are going to ask questions. The next honorable member is Honorable Malomane. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Greetings to Mr. Mulibalwa. Chair, on the CV that Mr. Mulibalwa submitted, and the language activities, it speaks about drafting language policy for provincial municipalities on the district. And also, he attended a national language policy framework course or training with the Department of Arts and Culture. So my question will be, what are the key arguments expounded by the National Language Policy Framework and enforced by the use of Official Language Act number 12 of 2012 in relation to language use? Have you identified any gaps between language policy and implementation? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable uh, Member. Um, policy and implementation. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's perhaps a note, I mean, worthy to note that we, Pencil has to be monitoring about 36 national departments throughout the country for compliance or non-compliance. And uh, because it seems to be a voluntary measure, since some even of the provinces are hardly ever, uh, I mean, uh, uh, drafted their own uh, Use of Languages Act. That's why I say by implementation, if you want to enact as a driving force, 
you, you don't actually have teeth. You, have, you, don't, you don't have strength. So really, the 36 departments, the national departments, have not come to party. Uh, if there are a few that are trying to, they hardly have a policy for them. There can't be implementation without policy. So policies have, uh, have to be there. I'm aware that parents have been trying to get uh, feedback from how far they are. I think it has cost us over eight years. We should definitely be doing something else other than just give us policy. When implementation is not happening, maybe the the incoming board shall have to do other means and of help and also collaborating with other entities that can help them, like human rights and other other agencies that are equal strength with pencil. Maybe that way. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, the another question uh, is going to be asked by Honorable the Chief Lutuli. To you, Honorable Chief Lutuli. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, to you, Mr. Molly Balwa. What role can the language awareness campaign play play in the promotion of multilingualism and the development of the sign language board, sign language? I thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Honor. In course. Uh, 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 what role can uh, awareness? Uh, I think awareness is good. It's not. It's, 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 it's. We have been, I mean, Pencil has been awareness campaign since 2004, to, since the passing of the, of the act. And I think maybe we, it has not been massive. And then I don't know, maybe the only problem is that people don't take language seriously as a right. They think there are minor things that are, they've got better things to attend to, maybe that are needy. But I think I'll agree with you that you have to, the board, the board has to start all over again, not take for granted that it's been happening. So go to this, pamphleteering, going to schools. Schools can be told easily because they are already in, a, you know, in, a, in an area where they can find easy churches, pamphlets. Radios also must allow them space to definitely make this uh, advocacy. That will definitely help in terms of practicing multilingualism. Remember, some of you, you know, the, I, mean, I mean, educated people like schools. They hardly even are aware that the law says that the, the learners must be taught in their, in their mother tongue. They hardly even are there, but they're also schools. So we take for granted. So I've realized that there are many people even in the schools, SGBs, as long as you give your school governing bodies a permission to say the SGB uh, will do as they wish in vis-a-vis in -vis language policy, we will never have our languages been used. Please, it is, it, it is a right of the people and there's a, a lot of violation. What do we do to these schools? Maybe they must be conscientized chief, king, that pencil must get to those, talk to all the departments and uh, be thorough and give them time frame, time frame to say this when this must be submitted to board. And if not, it's a violation immediately. We must wave the war. I mean, the words and the phrase that says pencil may not, because they are aware of the ill. Therefore, we must be allowed as pencil. The board, I mean, the, the board must be allowed to voice where they find there can be uh, 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 investigations around certain areas when where violation is imminent. Thank you, team. Hey, thank you, my king. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Honorable members, is there any member who wants to uh, ask question? Um, thank you, honorable members. Uh, now is the time that say, you may uh, say and ask whatever you want to say, but the, this process now uh, will be taking as committee uh, back to the department, uh, and then you'll hear from the department uh, the results of the interviews. You are about 25. The department will take uh, not more than 15 uh, board members. 
we are giving you this chance to uh, say your last words with the committee. I thank you. Um, thank you. The last week is an honor that I think some of the things I've made that it is the portfolio committee, perhaps um, as an important arm of government, of parliament, to, 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 to really look into some of the things I've tried to raise, particularly the reporting mechanism, whether really the board for effectiveness should be reporting to the ministry rather than perhaps to the Speaker of the House, because she's got access to parliament so that things can be deliberated. It goes that long way through the minister and so forth and so on, not that uh, I, I look at, <laughs> at the process as inferior, but you should really think about it yourselves because you are, we are part of government that it helps you as government to achieve. Now, look all the mechanisms. We shouldn't just be repeating what we've been doing all the years. You should also look into this and perhaps make sense of whatever I've said, whether uh, I'll be there or not. Thank you, Chairperson. We've noted what we are saying. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now we are releasing you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Honorable members, can we stretch uh, our legs and then we must come back at... Can we break and go for the lunch and we'll come at quarter to two? Quarter to two. Look at the time. Now it's quarter to one. And we must. Hi, Bo.
Good afternoon, honorable members. I'm suspecting that you are honored enough. You cannot sleep after uh, not having, uh, digesting your food. Uh, each job, each job. Uh, here we are back now. And the next uh, candidate on the list is... Uh, Advocate Melo, uh, hoping that uh, Advocate Melo uh, is with us. Uh, adv advocate, oh yes. Um, good afternoon, uh, Advocate. Afternoon, afternoon, uh, my chairperson <laughs> and members. <laughs> Okay, can can you just we want to you to show us the face? You know what? I'm coming from one area. Uh, there's area called Mbizane Mampongweni. They will saying Ubu So now uh, they are saying when uh, they see that this is a beautiful woman. He's saying, oh, son, don't pass on. So may we see your face? Uh... <laughs> uh, okay, no, it's fine, Chairperson. I'm trying to, I don't know, I'm using my, can you see me? I'm not sure whether. Not yet, Let not me... yet. Mm, no. Uh, I'm struggling here, Chair. I don't know how I'm going to. Uh, let me just try. Just hold on. Um, it's good. We are going to wait, honourable members, because we cannot interview a candidate that we cannot see. Uh, just that he must. <laughs> You must show his face and then he can switch off. Uh, why are you laughing at, at me, Doc? Uh, as we're doing the interviews, one of the candidates was overseas and the chairperson stopped the meeting and said, no, perhaps somebody might be responding on your behalf. So I want to see you throughout the process. So... <laughs> Advocate Melo, uh, the time is ticking. Uh, we're going to interview 10 of you today.
But it's still saying that it, it's still saying it says that I must setting from the device. Okay, let me let me just do this. Um, let me go to setting. It says I must go to setting and uh, I'm sorry for this one. Right? You know? What is setting? It says camera. Camera, camera. Honorable members, I'm suggesting that let's call another um, candidate and then uh, one of our staff members, I cannot release Utrabu, try to talk and assist advocate. Uh, I'm proposing that, honorable members. Thank you, but Chair. The, the problem is that uh, he was... The next person was going to... Oh. Can you see me? <laughs> How young is this? <laughs> we do see you. <laughs> can, can, can you see me, Chair? <laughs> yes. My apo I'm, I'm just sending my apology, uh, Chair Pesce. Yeah, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually... I I'm don't have no, you know this, this technology is, is not our friend section. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm laughing at you. Okay. Um no, thanks, Jay. <laughs> can we take this opportunity to uh to welcome you, Advocate uh, Melo? Oh, okay, Melo. Um Advocate Melo. We are the members of parliament uh, who are here, and I'm a chairperson of this committee called Sport, Arts, and Culture. Correct. Uh, uh, the members are going to uh, are going to introduce a member when is he or she is asking a question. We have all our secretariat, uh, all our researchers, content advisors, the interpreters and our doctor from <coughs> department who's responsible of looking the processes uh, which we are doing here. Um, now uh, you have five minutes to tell who you are, but you must not forget that we have your CV, but if you want to say uh, just a few words and then uh, you must be aware that we are giving you 45 minutes uh, inclusive of what I'm saying to answer questions. So uh, can now uh, tell us who you are. If we are exceeding these five minutes of introducing yourself, I'll tell you. But it's most of uh, the candidates, they don't take that all five minutes. Uh, they will finish uh, other minutes to the uh, questions when they are answering. To you, uh, Advocate Melo. Uh, okay, thank you. If you okay, have a problem, 
we have seen you you can switch off your your video if you like or if you don't uh, uh, you may not uh, tell us who are you well uh, seen... thank you thank you thank you chairperson i hope you can hear me you can hear me chairperson yes advocate Okay, thank you uh, very much, Chairperson, for this opportunity to allow me to form part of this engagement. Uh, Chairperson, I'm, I've actually, myself, actually, I'm a practicing advocate, uh, Chairperson, who actually, uh, I'm also serving on different uh, boards. Uh, you can see my profile, Chairperson, in front of you, that really, and I'm also a presiding um, a, a member of the specialized court, the consumer court, uh, which actually dealing with cases involving consumers and and businesses, especially in, um, here in Gauti. So I'm dealing with the provincial um, uh, consumer matters, the whole province of Gauti. And also, I'm also the chairperson of the uh, appeal, uh, um, I mean, heritage tribunal in Gauti. Where I deal with uh, normally deal with the uh, heritage matters, appeal on heritage matters, and I've been involved in lots of awareness, and I'm also serving on the different you know uh, you know entities as the audit member, and also uh, of the those entities, and I'm also uh, serving with uh, you know the office of disclosure where I'm also a member, a chairperson of the. Uh, uh, stakeholder uh, education and awareness, uh, and also as a, also as part of the, the 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 legal committee, where actually I'm currently busy with, uh, trying to assist the minister with the amendment of the of the act. Uh, you know, chairperson, I think I'm on in my practice. I'm dealing with commercial and corporate uh, matters, and I'm also you know presiding on different tribunal in South Africa. Municipal, you know, tribunal. That is where actually you'll find me, and 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 also I'm also some member of executive council of uh, College of Haute. and in Limpopo, the Eastern Cape also have just recently appointed as the members of the audit committee for Balfour uh, uh, Metro City, uh, City Metro in, in in Eastern Cape. So I was there actually yesterday dealing with uh, some some issues, but I'm here. I'm back, Chairperson. I think. Allow me to post me uh, to post here, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Advocate. Uh, Advocate, now I'm calling Honorable Adams uh, to ask you a question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. And uh, greetings to Advocate Gabriel Mello. My question will be, explain why the Pan South Africa Language Board should have a member with legal expertise. If you were to be appointed to the board, what role would you be? What role will you play at PANSOP? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, honorable member. Look, member, you know, it's very important that to have uh, someone like myself. Remember, I'm. Um, I'm actually, as I've alluded, that I'm saving, um, presiding on in different tribunal in South Africa. You know, I also have the experience in, I was the chairperson of the uh, BEC, procure, I mean, uh, BEC, uh, which actually dealing with the uh, presiding over the tender process. And also, I was also a member, an expert, a legal expert uh, on uh, BAC. So, so, so actually, I was actually chairing and advising at the same time, making sure that uh, Things are done properly in terms of the procurement uh, legislation. So, as a legal person, my responsibility will make sure that they actually the entity actually comply with the laws. Because you'll understand that uh, the institution actually was created, uh, you know, in terms of the constitution, which actually, uh, in terms of the the the, the Pan Africanist uh, Language Board Act, which actually Section Six which is actually they are carrying out the constitutional mandate. So it's very important that to make sure that uh, the entity comply with, uh, with the, the, with the uh, relevant legislation because there are a number of legislation that they are attached to that. For example, the 
the act that actually, you know, uh, specifically, you know, mandated the NTP to carry uh, its mandate. And also the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa is one of the act legislation that is very important. So I'm, 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 I have experience, you know, even the issue of auditing. I will also assist in auditing. If you look at uh, uh, my qualification, actually, I've actually, you know, advised on, on, on legal matters, uh, you know, university, I mean, university, you know, so they've been relying on my reports, you know, after the adjudication of uh, different, you know, tenders. So I will just go and present the presentation and uh, to the uh, BAC and also to provide the reason why the, this particular uh, service provider are supposed to be appointed because we need, we have the constitutional mandate. So I will be advising them with the issue of compliance, the legal matters, and also if there is need on, 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 on other you know uh, matters that they need to be uh, actually you know advised I'll be there and also you'll understand that very well that all the entity they have the legal you know department which actually you know as a as as, as the entity they will have to bring the reports you know audit the reports I mean to audit committees and and we we'll, we we'll have to check whether they are comply there is their proper internal control and also the risk, uh, you know, uh, measures are in place so that the entity can be run properly. So, so I have the, you know, vast experience, uh, and also dealing with the issue of, uh, you know, contracts because I, I actually deal with most of the matters that involving, you know, entity, you know, uh, infringement of, I mean, non-compliance with, with the with the procurement legislation and also non-compliance with the contract. So. I think I'm also I can also form part of the legal committees, so at least and also to advise on the policies that they are in place, because you'll understand that uh, the entity also deal with the, you know, with the, you know, with the, you know, complaints related to linguistic uh, human rights. So probably I'll be you know, uh, you I mean useful to the entity, you know, and also on the other side I also have the dispute resolution. I'm acting as also as a mediation and arbitrator at this point in time. So you know, uh, my vast experience in I mean in legal and and, and compliance and regulatory you know matters it will be definitely be useful to to this entity because entity need the you know proper you know corporate uh, uh, governance in order to exist uh, and be able to you know. To discharge their responsibility in terms of the constitutional mandate. So at this point in time, allow me members to pause here at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you, Advocate. The the next uh, honorable member uh, who's going to ask question. Uh, it's Honorable Sibia. Thank you. Mm, thanks, Chairperson. Greetings to Advocate Melo. Uh, uh, section, thank you, Melo. Section 62 of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa acknowledges that indigenous languages are facing a challenge of diminishing and thus requires the state to take practical steps and positive measures to elevate their status and advance the use of these languages. The question is, what is your opinion on this section? Two, what measures would you put in place to ensure that the state, including provinces and municipalities, comply fully with these constitutional requirements? I thank you. Look, thank you uh, uh, for the question, the Honorable Member. Look, what is very important, the key, because I've realized that most of, most of uh, people, actually, they are not familiar with you know, most of the entity, state entity, which actually such as this one. So the first thing that we, we need to do, actually, we need to come up with the program, the, 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 the awareness program. Since well, I've mentioned that I'm, I'm the chairperson of the, you know, the uh, education awareness and stakeholder management. So I'm dealing with the, the, the project where I normally do 
uh, out, uh, you know, awareness, uh, you know, consumer education awareness to all different provinces. Especially now, I've drafted, you know, the the operational plan where actually we go to different municipalities. Even this, in this particular circumstance, we'll have to liaise with the different municipality to capacitate uh, the man the municipality about the. Uh, you know, you know the, the 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 legislation and also the mandate. Actually, the mandate of the of the of the of the entity, so that at least we communicate with them, we engage with the councils there. We also engage with the with the district municipalities, yeah, making sure that there are some awareness and also engage with the different you know university within which are actually situated in particular municipalities so that they can be awareness and doing partnership with actually other entity or other, you know, uh, chapter nine institution, uh, such as commission for, uh, for the promotion uh, 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 and protection of, of the rights of uh, cultural and linguistic uh, communities. So, so they, that will be, uh, uh, you know, a way to go, making sure that the, 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 the the official of different all different municipality, they are aware of the the mandate of the institution, and making sure that we do partnership with a uh, different uh, uh, you know entity that they are within those uh, uh, municipalities, so that they can be capacitated and be actually know very well that uh, non compliance with uh, with the legislation, there are some uh, consequence to that effect. So at this point in time, uh, it, it's it's you will understand that member that there is no organization that will exist in isolation. So in order to execute the mandate, you need to have a strong partnership with other stakeholders, as I've already mentioned, so that at least you can be able to spread the gospel. And there should be some, you know, when you go and do the, uh, you know, the awareness, there should be some banners, the document, I mean, the pamphlet uh, need to be a part of the, 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 the awareness and also make sure that you engage with the uh, senior official within the municipality uh, before the, 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 you know, hosting the, the awareness uh, project. And, and also some roadshows, also they can also form part of the, you know, the, the awareness and, and making sure that at least they understand the, their mandate as the, as the different municipalities and uh, different uh, entities, because indeed, we can't be able. The entity cannot execute the uh, its mandate uh, without other, you know, organization because it's one of the mandate. It's one of the uh, the main objective of the of the this entity to make sure that they have a partnership with other constitutional body dealing with uh, linguistic human rights, uh, and also those uh, 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 other stakeholders. They will also deal with uh, act as a uh, you know agent of change, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, uh, 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 they spread the gospel, even though the entity, you know, uh, 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 is gone, or probably is no, uh, they are no longer probably, for example, you go and do the uh, consumer education, but you left the, the, the pamphlet. So, meaning that the public will have access to those pamphlets so that they can be able to capacitate themselves. Allow me, member, to pause here at this point in time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Advocate. The next honorable member is Honorable Joseph. Uh, good. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Good afternoon, Advocate uh, Mello. Thank you. Uh, thank you, member. My question I will ask relates to Section 6, in brackets, 4 of the Constitution of the Republic that empowers government, both national and provincial to regulate and monitor the use of official languages to ensure that they enjoy parity and are treated, treated equitably. What legal and operational measures would you put in place to make this to come into effect? Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, th thank you, members. Look, uh... It's, it's very important that we engage uh, we engage the department uh, other stakeholders such as the Department of Education. Remember, Department of Education is one of the department which actually responsible for uh, education. 
So they, they will have to actually introduce, uh, you know, programs where actually uh, uh, and come up with the, 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 the policy. But at this point in time, there is uh, also the policy the, the, which is dealing with the, the, you know, the official language where actually uh, the Department of Education, I, I, I do believe that in Eastern Cape, I think they've started to implement, I mean, to teach um, some uh, learners uh, in some of the school with their uh, official uh, uh, language at this point in time. I think the program probably will start properly uh, in 2015, if I'm not mistaken. So that is how the, the, the you know, because the, the in terms of the constitution, it's very clear that the state, they need to actually make sure that the policy are in place in order to promote uh, the usage and, you know, of, of, of uh, official, I mean, of the, the uh, indigenous uh, languages. And, 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 and with other, you know, entity, because the, the, the issue of capacity building is very important because you come up with the measure making sure that the policy, if they are, uh, the, the language policy uh, it is not in accordance, will have to make sure that to have the, the, the you know, the, the, the engagement with them so that they can rectify and assist them with the with uh, such uh, 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 those politi- po- policies and, and and another thing is that uh, as I have alluded uh, that it, it, it can't be correct that uh, the entity on its own actually uh, you know uh, uh, you know do awareness so they need to actually have Advocate, I've seen there. I wonder what's going on. The opportunity. So, uh, so, just a moment. Uh, are you moving uh, from where you were? Because no, 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 I'm not. Moving. No, I'm not moving, Chairperson. I think there was someone who was calling me from the from my device, actually. Um, let's advise you that you must just put uh, that mode uh, called. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm having a problem that if people they calling you. And then they disturbed you and our good selves. There is a. Mm. Have, do you have a, the the that mode called a flight mode in order that no one must get in whilst we are we are we are. But okay, uh, okay, let, okay. Yeah, no. Let me try, it, Chairperson. Let me try the. I no, no, the, the, I'm harassed by my members because I'm I'm trying to save them because you were when you answering a call whilst we interviewing you, uh, you just stopped and now I don't know what are they saying. I must listen. I'm seeing them shaking heads because I'm, I'm worried because if your phone is also receiving whilst you are doing interview. And I'm not sure, Ujabu, uh, the secretary, what he can she advise you? Jabu, talk to the to the mic and advise the the candidate. Uh, I'm not. I don't take this advice. They are saying, let me let you continue, but we didn't hear you because of the interruption of the call. If again is going to do that, what are you going to say, honorable members? Are you going to score him saying that you did hear him? That's the problem that I'm having. That's why I want an advice. When you are saying I must leave him, continue whilst we didn't hear what he is saying. Uh, Try, uh, I am not sure what are you going to assist. because once the calls are getting in, you cannot avoid, you are not going to answer, but it's going to cut you from our good selves. We're having that problem. 
No, no, Chairperson. No, Chairperson. I did not answer any call. I did not answer any call. What? I saw the the call coming, but I did not even uh, answer the call, Chairperson. Uh, to be honest, I did not actually. You know. We are saying you didn't answer, but it did cut you from us as members of Parliament. Okay. But, uh, let um, me I... let you continue. Continue. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether the members, where must I uh, start, uh, Chairperson, you know, or maybe I must start from the onset. Maybe can I allow members to probably to... to... You cannot start from onset because of the time. Continue. Okay. Okay. Where no, you is... okay. I think, Chairperson, what I was saying that... Uh, I was saying that in order for to make sure that the, the, the national department or provincial uh, uh, department to comply, uh, you know, uh, is the issue of partnership uh, with other, you know, stakeholders. Because the entity actually, as I've alluded initially, that the entity cannot be able to execute their mandate without the other stakeholders. Uh, it's, it's of paramount importance because this is, is a constitutional mandate which actually require all of us, you know, like such as I was, I, I did mention, Chairperson, that uh, uh, there are some of the institutions such as Commission for uh, Promotion and Protection of uh, the Rights of Cultural Linguistic uh, Communities, which actually need actually to be, uh, to, be to, to form part of the, 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 the awareness, the public awareness, and, and making sure that the also, the Department of Education must also actually people need to be capacitated and actually introduce the the people actually at school need to be actually be uh, you know taught uh, be teach uh, in in, uh, uh, in their language. So so it's very important that the Department of Education must come on board in order to you know to spread because it's the Department, which actually has the mandate to make sure that people are capacitated. And in terms of the constitution, it's very clear which is section, in terms of section uh, 30, 30 of the constitution, the Bill of Rights, it says talk about the language and culture. Everyone has the right to use the language and to participate with cultural life of their choice. But on, on, on those exercises, they must exercise, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, in in terms of also with the constitution, because you look, agree with me, Chairperson, that the Bill of Rights, all the provision of the Bill of Rights, they are limited in terms of Section thirty six of the constitution, and 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 it, it's of paramount importance that uh, there should be a monitoring, uh, a monitoring, uh, you know, uh, processes. Uh, to check if the entities actually indeed they are complying with the constitution and the policies which are in place, uh, uh, Chairperson, and the Act. So allow me, Chairperson, here to pause. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Advocate. The next uh, Honourable Member who's going to ask you a question is Honourable Zondi. Thank you, Honourable Chairperson, and good afternoon to Advocate Melo. I'm, I'm, I'm okay, Bemba. <clears throat> Your next question, uh, Advocate, is following the publication of the language statistics released the state South, by State South Africa for the census 2022, PENSAV has expressed some concerns about the sharp decline in South African sign language. This is significant as South African Sign Language is now recognized as an official language. Additionally, Pencil highlighted the decrease in the number of Isindebele speakers in schools and noted that the metric class of 2022 marked the first class without a single learner registered to learn Isiswati in the Gauteng province. The proportion of English, Sitsonga, and Shivenda speakers has remained relatively stable. However, the statistics show a decrease in the number of Africans and Nisitloza speakers and decline in the use of Kohen sign languages. What is your analysis 
of this situation. If you were appointed to Pencil, what measures would you put in place to ensure that indigenous language grow? Gabo. Well, well, in terms of this is the constitutional mandate. Remember, the the first thing that we we, we need to do, we have to get the the legal opinion uh, on the matter, and and be able to advise properly. Uh, remember the, the 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 constitution actually is very clear that. Um, uh, it it it's it's very important to check if uh, the dominated language in a particular area and 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 actually look at um and 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 look at the the uh, which language actually can be actually be uh, you know be applicable or be used in in that particular uh, uh, you know area or or in that particular entity or or you know facility so 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 in this particular circumstances it's it's very important to actually to 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 actually try to 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 investigate you know if if you stay such uh, you have to investigate and interview other you know affected parties in order to you know, to get, I mean, to get, uh, you know, uh, evidence or the information that will assist you to arrive to a, a proper uh, determination. With regard to the the measures, it's 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 advisable that they they need to be a language, uh, uh, you know, policy. Uh, as I have alluded initially, that uh, there is what you call the use of official language act of 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 I mean, Act Twelve of 2012, which actually uh, the Department of Education actually uh, they've actually uh, promulgated, which actually it's it's very clear that uh, uh, you know at school, uh, I mean they, uh, let me say not at school, uh, uh, all the entities need to have the language uh, uh, policy. So. In that particular circumstance, there will be a need to for for the engagement with the, the you know with the particular uh, institution or the facility to make sure that they have the language uh, policy in place and making sure that the constitution actually uh, you know they they actually comply with the constitution because indeed uh, we 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 need to actually to make sure that the indigenous uh, languages are actually uh, protected and protected, promoted, uh, uh, you know, in South Africa. So it's very important that the measures there, the, the issue of, 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 of you, know, uh, you know, compliance, monitoring, there should be a monitoring plan. And after we have assisted them probably with the, you know, with the policy and, and, and engaging with them and also the issue of of capacity building awareness uh, to make sure that they understand the the I mean the legislation and other policies I mean uh, the p policies that they are you know are in place and also the 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 constitution because you will agree with me that the the this actually is one of the the uh, the mandate is derived from the the the, the constitution because uh, section section two of the constitution. Uh, it's very clear that the constitution is the supreme law of the of the land. Any uh, conduct that is inconsistent with it, it will be regarded as a null and void in these particular circumstances. Uh, allow me, members, to uh, to pause here. But in addition to that, uh, as I have alluded, that there are different stakeholders, such as the. Uh, the chapter nine institution that I've mentioned initially, to also to partner with them that they actually try to uh, make sure that uh, uh, the, the the knowledge is is, is actually uh, conveyed to to the relevant uh, parties that they are involved. 
and so that uh, we can be uh, collectively uh, uh, execute uh, uh, this in, an important uh, uh, mandate. Thank you, member. Thank you, Advocate. The next uh, honorable member is Honorable Malomane. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Greetings to Advocate Melo. Thank you, thank you, member. Thank you. My question, it will be based on the issue of risk management as you serve as a member of the Risk and Audit Committee in several institutions, which is Gauteng College of Nursing and also in Northwest. I've seen that you are serving as a member of Risk and Audit Committee. If you were to be appointed to Kensler, what legal system would you put to place to ensure, sorry, to ensure that fraud and corruption does not take place within the organization? Thank you, Chair. Look, uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Member. Look, the, the first thing actually is very important that the, you see the IT is, is of paramount importance. The, the the i uh, the you know the ict need to be up to standard to make sure that there is a proper internal control and 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 actually there must be policies that deal with the you know with the you know with the protocol the you see the, the some you know uh, uh, hr policy need to be there uh, in case people they contravene and they also uh, uh, they must actually be, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, people who actually, you know, uh, because you'll understand that they, there is what you call an internal, uh, uh, you know, audit committee, which actually normally report to the uh, the main, uh, uh, you know, audit committee. Uh, it's, it's it's very important that uh, the policies need to be in place which are dealing with the, the fraud and corruption. And also the committee also need to be established, which specifically focus on those uh, matters and, and so that they can be a smooth running. And they need to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, clear mandate as to, uh, uh, I mean, to, I mean the, the mandate of the senior uh, uh, official with regard to the authorization uh, of uh, you know uh, uh, resources uh, uh, within the, the within the the particular entity or between the department because policies are of paramount importance. Uh, that policy will also outline you know a legislation that actually you know give rise to those uh, uh, you know policies. So it's of paramount important that there must be proper measures. The committee risk committee need to be there. And, and and be able to 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 actually to monitor uh, frequently monitor uh, the, the 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 you know the plan that is that are in place and 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 actually making sure that uh, also the the official actually they they are capacitated in those policies because you can't implement the policies uh, you know for example the the, the yeah the policy without uh, capacitating the official. The official need to be capacitated with regard to a, uh, you know, a poli policies first, and therefore, uh, before the implementation, because it will be unfair to implement the policies th that were not uh, actually well. The the officials, uh, they are not familiar with, and also the consequence thereof, uh, so that they know very well that these are the the, the trail and the protocol in which. Uh, uh, you know, they have to follow us when they are dealing with the issue of assets, the issue of, of authorization in the finance, uh, you know, section. So those policies are very are of paramount importance uh, in order to, you know, to have a, a proper uh, internal control. Uh, you know, even in the finance, they should be, uh, you know, a protocol and procedure in which uh, all the officials need to be followed. Uh, before they act, and the, the the mandate need also to be clear on those policies, and the consequence also must be clear on those policies to say that in case 
And the IT also is of paramount importance because as I've stated that the, there is no institution that, uh, you know, will exist uh, uh, without the IT, uh, you know, be in place. So IT people need to be, uh, you know, need to hire the competent people, the relevant people that they are on board so that they can be able to be able to execute their mandate exceptionally well. Uh, allow me, the Honourable Member, to pause here at this point in time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Advocate Melo. Uh, may I give the Honourable Member the chance uh, to ask further questions? Thank you. Honor thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Honourable Melo Mane. Thank you, Chair. Advocate, when he was respons uh, re responding to the question of Honourable Zondi, he is specifically used the issue of the use of Official Language Act number 12 of 2012. So I just want to find out what are the key arguments expounded by the National Language Policy Framework and enforced by the use of Official Language Act number 12 of 2012 in relation to language use. Have you identified any gaps between language policy and implementation? Thank you, Chair. Well, thank you, the honourable member. Look, the the issue of uh, the issue of implementation it's it's a, still a problem, still a problem, uh, 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 chairperson and the honourable members. That look, at this point in time, you know, for example, myself actually, I I understand that things are legislation uh, they've been um, uh, you know. Uh, amended, but you know, most of, of us actually that we've been studying during the past, we were actually studying. I mean, you know, taught in in in, in at the institution of higher learning, uh, you know, uh, uh, in English, and 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 now there is a you know, uh, you know, the issue of 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 you know, possibility of, of probably implementing. People will be probably in future be you know taught in their in you know indigenous uh, language their official languages. So uh, look, the issue of implementation is still a problem. The issue of a uh, sign language because we still have uh, uh, in terms of my knowledge, there's still a problem with the issue of of, of implementation and the sign language because. Really, we we need to actually, uh, uh, you know, the 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 entity must also be able to, in future, and together with the government, to actually to make sure that they uh, avail, uh, you know, bursaries uh, uh, bursaries are available to actually to take, I mean, to encourage people to deal with, um, you know, uh, 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 you know. To further studies with regard to lang different languages and and also including the sign languages. So the issue of implementation is still a problem because uh, uh, I myself I I still believe that you know you find that uh, at the some of the school you know uh, they did not actually they, they are no longer you know they are not yet even implementing what has been suggested in terms of the you know, I um, mean the, uh, the 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 policy. So it's it's, it's very important that we we uh, collectively, uh, including uh, you members, uh, to make sure that we 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 actually try to to help where possible so that we can promote uh, uh, our indigenous uh, uh, language. Yes, indeed, um, there's still a challenge. Implementation is a problem. So I, 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 I think I also call upon the institution of higher learning, such as universities and other, you know, chapter nine institution, which actually mandated, as I have already, uh, you know, mentioned initially, uh, to actually to come together and make sure that uh, to assist uh, this uh, institution to implement uh, such, because well, implementation is not something that is can happen to overnight. But gradually, we will definitely uh, reach uh, our our main objective uh, going forward. Because this is the is the constitutional mandate that needs to be executed. 
and 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 you know we we as the 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 the, the public we need to actually enjoy the benefit of this uh, 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 you know policies which are in place uh thank you chairperson uh, uh, and members thank you uh, advocate melo now we're coming to coming back to you to tell you this is the end of the questions from the members and we are thanking you uh, about your time that you must come and give us this input with the interest that you can be part of Pranslam board. But uh, also uh, we are giving you this opportunity to, if you want to say something, you can do so. I thank you. Okay. Thank you uh, very much, uh, person. I, I, I thank you very much for 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 giving me this opportunity to form part of this process. Uh, well, I know very well that it was not an easy task on your side for selecting the candidates, but indeed, uh, I'm thankful to to have been given uh, uh, this opportunity to come and have the engagement with uh, the members of the. The, of the parliament uh, so that I can be able to make a further submission with regard to uh, my capacity. Thank you uh, very much, Chairperson, and the honorable members. Uh, take care until we meet one day. Thank you, members. Thank you, Advocate Melo. Thank you again. Now we can release you. Go well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson and members. Bye-bye. Remember, the, the next uh, candidate is going to be advocating Jeza. Advocate Njeza, how are you? Good afternoon. I'm well, thanks. And how are you? I'm fine. Uh, thank you, uh, Advocate Njeza. Uh, we are here today as the committee. I'm the chairperson of the committee with honorable members who are members of this committee called Sports, Arts and Culture. Uh, we, we are taking this uh, opportunity uh, to ask you uh, that can you tell us who are you but also you must not forget that your CV is with us but uh, procedural we need when you uh, get in this space to tell us uh, who are you within five minutes uh, we'll be having a 45 minutes to answer the questions that the members are going to pose to you. I thank you, Advocate. Okay. My name is Nondutu Zelonjeza. Thank you, Chairperson. My name is Nondutu Zelonjeza. I'm based in Pretoria. Uh, I, I, I stay in Pretoria. Um, um, my background is in various is in various things. I started off as an internal auditor, uh, finance manager in various companies. So I started working in the year 2000 when I finished university 
and I started working. I've got about 23 years working in the private sector in various industries. Uh, like I said, I started as an internal auditor, moved to financial management, and moved into general management. The last 16 years I've spent in healthcare, where I have been working as a um, hospital general management in various private hospitals in South Africa, uh, general management and partly part of legal advising in, in the private healthcare sector I've been in. And I, I then, I was admitted as an advocate 2017 uh, by the Pretoria High Court. And I didn't start practicing immediately. I started, I'm, I started practicing in this year in 2014. I'm currently in legal practice as an advocate in Pretoria, in Gauteng generally. And yeah, that's where I'm at. In terms of qualifications, I, I've got internal auditing, which I did from the then Cape Technicon. And then I've got a, an LLB, which I did at UNISA. And I've got health economics, which I did with the UCT. With the UCT. And I think the health economics was informed by uh, that I have been in the healthcare sector and that I have developed interest in terms of understanding the health economics in the country. And I also think in light of the, the NHI that's in the horizon in the country, it was important for me to position myself in terms of understanding the background of, of the health economy in South Africa and the, aligning that with the legal background uh, in terms of health policies and the healthcare framework in the country, public healthcare framework in the country. So that's how I did the health economics, which I graduated 2002 with it. But so that's who I am generally. I, yeah, that's that's who I am. I'm, I'm currently, like I said, I'm in private practice as an advocate. I started in this year. I left employment and I'm sort of setting up, started setting up a practice as an advocate. Thank you so much, uh, Advocate Njeza. Uh, now, uh, there's a member who's going to ask you a question. Uh, Honorable Member Adams. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson, and greetings to Advocate uh, Njeza. Of Jeza. Thank you. And Jeza, sorry for yes. not pronouncing it correctly. My question to you, uh, Advocate, explain why the Pen South Africa Language Board should have a member with legal expertise. If you were to be appointed to the board, what role would you play at Pen South? I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Perhaps, uh, um, Advocate Njaza, you allowed to switch off your. Uh, camera okay. was seeing that uh, time goes on, you will be in a, a problem. Uh, we've seen you, we have allowed that you can switch it off. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you for that question, uh, Honorable Member Adams. Maybe in my introduction, I forgot to mention that I serve in a, in a number of boards in, within the public sector in South Africa. I, I serve in uh, in one currently in the Road Accident Fund Board. And uh, part of my role there, and, and I also serve in the VOCMA, which is the Vile Orange Catchment Management Area Board. One of my roles in those boards and primary for my appointment to answer your question is that uh, I, I have an oversight, as the, because I have got a legal background, I have an oversight in terms of uh, any legal things that the board would need to make uh, decisions on that there's a person with a legal background and also for the board to be able to understand and interpret um, interpret any legislations any 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 legal things any legal any legal matters that are on the legislations that are governing for example if we talk about the pen South African language board is that there are a lot of legislations which are which the board is based on now, one, I should be able to understand that, but also assist the board 
in terms of interpreting our mandate as it is directed by those legislations. So it's very important for any board in terms of governance to have a, a legal person because it makes it easy for the interpretation of laws, any related laws that governs, for example, that governs uh, the language implementation in the country or anything that has to do with language and culture in the country. It's about interpretation, it's about understanding the legal framework, and it's about governance, part of legal, most of legal uh, aligns a lot with governance, uh, in, in terms of, 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 of being in boards, and boards are governance structures. That's why, Ms. Adams, I hope I answered your questions, Honorable Adams. I thank you, Honorable, Honorable Adams, and thank you, Advocate. Uh, the next uh, Honorable Member is Honorable Sibia. Mm, thanks, Chaperson. Greetings to you, Nandu Tuzelo Njeza, advocate. Uh, my question is in, in with section two, section six two of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa acknowledges that indigenous languages are facing a challenge of diminishing, and thus requires the state to take practical steps and positive measures to elevate their status and advance the use of these languages. The question is, what is your opinion on this section? And what measures would you put in place to ensure that the state, including provinces and municipalities, comply fully with this constitutional requirement? I thank you. Um, thank you, Honorable Sibia. I think for me, the, what the constitution refers to in section six, subsection two, it, refer, it refers to that really over time, even it has gotten worse after the, this constitution has been implement, has been put in place, is that we, we have prioritized or promoted the use of, of languages. In, for example, if you look at Gauteng, uh, as a province, especially in 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 the affluent areas, that there is a, 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 a very a, a exaggerated promo, a promotion of English, and I think that is mostly promoted by and 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 I'm using Gauteng because when I go home to a Eastern Cape, the minute I start to speak English, everybody looks at me funny. I default into English, even if I'm at a supermarket, everybody looks at me funny because in those in that setting. People are used to speaking is a closer as a language without mixing it normally. But what happens in in, in settings like your Gauteng and maybe your Western Cape is that because we've got diverse communities or diverse languages, people from diverse background in terms of language, we've all tended to 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 default into English, for example. Uh, and, and, and I mean amongst Black people, we default into English. It's the same way as we are having this interview in English because we have to accommodate the diversity of the people who are part of this conversation. And I think we haven't seen that, at least, we haven't really noticed or done anything with the damage that is causing. Our accommodation of diversity amongst us as Black people has allowed us to, 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 to see our own languages diminish. Your second question, you, you're asking, what could be done? What could I do? And I think for me, it's the the, the the practical thing is that we we need to stop putting our language as our languages as secondary. In as much as we're diverse, and we need to accommodate that diversity, as our constitution says, is that we need to make sure that in settings where, for example, in 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 Gauteng, as it is, is that the use of prevalent of languages is standardized, especially within government settings where in hospitals and clinics, but also in, I think the most important thing that our government has missed is promoting the use and standardizing for the use of languages within the growing private schools in South Africa and the multiracial schools. You might find that in government schools, yes, there is an accommodation of a localized language, but I think the private schools in as much as it might be in the legislation, they have gotten away with not standardizing and, and promoting 
uh, indigenous languages in their schools. So you find that my child goes to a private school, but there is no there is no offering of its course or is or is in that school. So even if they would have an interest in doing it, but it, it is just not offered. And and I think also that get that happens because a school in Centurion, ideally, what language should they be offering? Because it's a diverse uh, background of communities and families that resides within that. So, so I think government needs to, to, to there are policies, I think within South Africa, if you look at the language policies and, and, and legislations in the country, there are legislations. And I think we need to enforce uh, the implementation of, in the settings I've mentioned, and, and make sure that our languages don't even don't, are not left behind. I mean, if you look at news channels, uh, uh, even the news, they will go on for 15 minutes and the rest they are in English. And that's where we need in the publics, in the public resources and infrastructures that are meant to educate communities and inform communities. Our languages must be standardized as primary, not as secondary. Thank you, uh, Honorable CD. Thank you, Advocate. The next Honorable Member is Honorable Joseph. Thank you, Chairperson, and uh, good afternoon, Advocate and Zeza. Uh, my question to you will be around Section 6, Subsection 4 of the Constitution that empowers government, both national and provincial, to regulate and monitor the use of official languages to ensure that they enjoy parity and are treated equitably. What legal and operational measures would you put in place to make this to come into effect? Thank you. Um, thank you, Honorable Member. Sorry, I missed your, your name. And uh, your, your question is that in, 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 in what is mandated, I'm trying to understand, in what is mandated by the national government in the province? It wasn't what is their mandate? What is what is the legal? Honorable member, will you please emphasize the question for me in terms of what is the question is? I understand section six, subsection yes. four, but I just missed your question a bit. Sorry. Yeah. My last part of my question was what legal and operational measures would you put into place to ensure that this come into effect, referring to Section 4, Subsection 6 of the Constitution. Thank you. Okay. All right. I think for me, there's a, a greater part, uh, Honorable Member, of awareness uh, in terms of the, the, the legal provisions that are in different legislations in terms of promotion of languages by the different spheres of government is that there, there is often not awareness in terms of the, the existence, one, of these provisions, and number two, or, or, or because often in, in a, what we are educated to do in the country is that professional work must come in a, in a universal language, which is English. I think mostly what we need to do is make awareness and educate uh, uh, in, in our operational environment, is to, leg, leg, is to educate people about the legal provisions of the constitution and other statutes in terms of our responsibility and role in promoting languages, in promoting all languages in the country, regardless of where we are and in whatever way, without suppressing others, without, um, so, yeah, without suppressing others. It is just, I think there's an awareness campaign, an educational campaign that needs to be done of, of without repeating myself, of the legal framework in, in, in our operational environments. Not only in governments, but but generally in our communities, in our own areas of, of work, generally. Thank you, Advocate Thank you. Jessa. The next honorable member is Honorable Zondi. Thank you, Chair. And good afternoon to Advocate Jessa. Honorable, here is your next question. Following the publication of language statistics released by State South Africa for the census 2022, PENSA has expressed some concerns about the sharp decline in the South African sign language. 
this is significant as South African Sign Language is now recognized as an official language. Additionally, pencil highlighted the decrease in the number of Isindabele speakers in schools and noted that the metric class of 2022 marked the first class without a single learner registered to learn Siswati in the Gauteng province, for example. The proportion of English, Sijonga, and Shivenda speakers has remained relatively stable. However, the statistics show a decrease in the number of Africans and East Coast speakers and a decline in the use of Khoi and Sun languages. Now, what is your analysis of this situation? If you were appointed to pencil, what measures would you put in place to ensure the indigenous language grow? Thank you, Honorable Zondi. I, I think the, the question you pose, it, it, it centers around the education system in the country. What do we do from development stage? Because it, it talks about the, you, you mentioned, I think the census report talks about the sharp decline of sign language. We all know that the centers of teaching sign language in the country, they are not as widely distributed for, for, for and developed and looked after. So it, the census it is it, the results that came through the census would be as a result that the, the, the development of education in that field is, is minimal or it has fallen apart, it has declined. That's why you find that it, 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 the results, they reflect that. And I think with regards to other language in terms of statistics, as you mentioned, to my earlier point when I answered, um, I think it was Honorable uh, Adams, is that uh, the, the schooling system in the country, the education system in the country, I don't think we're monitoring it enough in terms of how it has taken it has taken a responsibility in terms of the promotion, the development of languages from that sector. And in them, in them, they, I don't think they've promoted in the schools the multilingualism. Uh, and I think we always celebrate if one child has written a pay, an English paper or a certain paper in Sikosa, one child out of how many children a million children in, in terms of matriculants. I think our first point would have to penetrate the education system in each stage of development in that children are, are given opportunities to, to know about the African languages and to study Afri in, in African languages. And I think for us, promotion would have to be at that source in order for it to grow and grow, grow over time. Into your question, what would I do? Is that we would need to, 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 to forge partnerships with the Department of Education, and especially at the lower levels, but I think in all levels, because uh, even, even though them in the university levels, which is higher education levels, you find that children are already engraved into speaking English. English. That's why I'm saying at development stage with the lower departments of education, we need to penetrate that and make sure that they comply in with regards to what the provisions in terms of language uh, in language promotion are saying. And that includes awareness, education, the partnerships that you, you form with community groups, the partnerships you form with NGOs, so that um, that education is not only left at school, but that education is part of communities. Thank you, Honorable Sitzundi. Thank you, uh, Advocate. The next Honorable Member, Honorable Maloman. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Greetings to Advocate Njeza. Advocate, as a person with risk management skills, my question will be, if you were to be appointed to pencil up, what legal system would you put to place to ensure that fraud and corruption does not take place within the organization? Thank you. 
Thank you, Honorable Member Malumani. I think as 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 a board member, and I think having served in in having worked one as a board leader, but also having served in audit and risk committees in various organizations, it is very important as a, as, as a board, especially as a committee as a, a delegated by the board to make sure that there is an assurance in terms of understanding the risk of the organization. So the executive would have to give us a risk register, but through that risk register and other measures, we'd have to make sure that the, the, the environment is a control environment. Control environment is that if there are audits that are done annually, internal and external, that's why it's very important that the chief audit or the CFO of the organization, if there's not chief audit executive, that they are they are part of the of the audit committees, so that they can give assurance to the board is that the environment there are controls. There's assurance that there is compliance to various, uh, for example, it's a public institutions, your PFMAs, and the auditor general uh, expectations, and all those kind of things, and that we are aligned to to or to good practice in terms of making sure that the environment is controlled so that we are able to detect fraud and, and any other uh, mismanagement that might happen in the organization. But it's very important for an organization from a board level that we get a, a, a well thought and a well done risk register, which will, uh, which will tell us which are the risks in the business. And then when we've identified that, then how do we make sure that then there is a control uh, uh, there are control measures that have been put in place. They are key risks. At least we are able to identify them before they happen. Or if they do happen, then we are able to identify without causing uh, damages. And that there is a culture of accountability within the organization. So, so in terms of, of systems, I think within uh, any government sphere, if, if you, it's just to make sure that there is a continuous monitoring, measuring, and 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 an understanding of of controls and risks and that's how you that's how you as a board from a board member you are able to support the organization and you are able to account because you understand the environment that it is water it is it is water tight thank, thank you, you uh, honorable members uh, thank you advocate. okay thank you advocate honorable members uh, is there any member who has got a question? Uh, advocate, uh, on behalf of this committee, we are thanking you to come and to be part of uh, the candidates. Uh, we are hoping you the best out of uh, this interview, but also uh, we wanted you to say something. Your last words uh, will be appreciating that. I thank you. But, um, thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you for the opportunity for me to be um, I mean, to be part of this of this interview process. And I think for me, the driver to to always apply in in the boards around the country, especially within government. It is, it is to support with, uh, with governance, with compliance, but it is to make sure that, so that there is the, the organizations that government intends to, 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 to set up so that they can make sure that with, around the country, there is a governance. They are supported by people with knowledge and understanding. So it is, it is always exciting for me when I, get called in these interviews because it means in somehow I would be playing a role in making sure that government achieves its mandate in making sure that the, 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 the promotion of language and multilingualism in the country is, is done. So I'm excited. I like governance. I like risk management and I like, I like legal because that's the way we can get our communities to be upright and do the right thing. Thank you, Honorable Chair, and thank you, Honorable Members. Thank you, uh, Advocate. Now we are releasing you. Thank you so much for when. Oh, thank you.
Eh, Advocate Fiduli. Eh, oh, yes. Yes, yes. We wanted to check whether you are ready with your mic and camera. We are saying, we are seeing that we are ready. Thank you so much. Uh, now, honorable members, uh, I want uh, now uh, to, to tell you that you see him. He's on the platform. Um, advocate, we are taking this opportunity to sit uh, in this August house uh, in order that we must do interviews to you advocates and the rest of the members who applied here. Uh, now, if you can tell us who are you in your five minutes, uh, whilst we are having 45 minutes uh, to answer the questions, uh, you can uh, summarize uh, the introduction of your good self because we have files in front of us. Uh, now, can you tell us who are you, Advocate? Thank you very much, Chair, uh, to you and the entire portfolio committee. Uh, just just uh, briefly, um, I'm Advocate for Julie. Uh, I'm from, I come from the Northwest. Uh, currently, I reside here in Pretoria. Uh, well, I'm an advocate by, by profession. Uh, I hold legal qualifications until a master's. I have extensive experience in the administration of organizations. I'm currently a CEO and registrar of, of, of a council. In a nutshell, that's, that's, that's me, Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Advocate. Uh, you were brief to the point. Unlike advocates, because you usually when we're uh, presiding in court, uh, yeah. we know your skills. You can cross question somebody, those who are liars, even uh, forgotten what they are saying. Uh, let me uh, give now the honorable member to ask a question, Honorable Adams. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson, and uh, greetings to Advocate uh, Faduli. Advocate, my question to you will be, explain why the PEN South Africa Language Board should have a member with legal expertise. If you were to be appointed to the board, what role will you play at PEN South? I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honourable Member, for that. I think, firstly, we need to appreciate the framework that sets out this uh, this board. So, firstly, the, the supreme law in the land, the constitution, uh, creates um, uh, this board. And this constitution then directs that uh, there must be equitable use uh, and, and, and advancement of all languages, official languages in South Africa. So, I think, firstly, it's important that the board appreciates this uh, this constitutional supremacy in terms of the directive to ensure that uh, languages in South Africa are promoted and are used across board. And secondly, uh, you look at the, 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 the founding legislation that founds this board as well. It requires somebody with an understanding of the law who can be able to interpret the text and the grammar um, in the law. Because sometimes uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult for someone who's not trained as a lawyer to be able to appreciate some of the language that are used. So we are trained to interpret the law and, and to make sure that we explain to those who are not trained uh, with the law. So I think my, my involvement will make sure that firstly we comply with the constitution. Uh, we put in mechanism in place to ensure that the, the board achieves um, its constitutional mandate, which is to ensure that it promotes um, all languages and ensure that all languages are used across. And also to comply with the mandate, which is set in the, in the legislation itself, there's also the, the, the Official uh, Languages uh, uh, Use Policy Act, which must also be implemented. So, so uh, uh, all those uh, uh, frameworks, those legal frameworks need to be interpreted. They need to, to be understood by all. And from those um, uh, um, uh, uh, legal frameworks, we need to develop action plans. We need to develop a strategy. We need to develop business plans, operational plans to make sure that we, we achieve 
the mandate of, of the board. So in a nutshell, I think that will be my 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 involvement on a member, just to make sure that uh, we are legally compliant uh, in all respects. Thank you. Thank you, Advocate. Uh, the next honorable member is Honorable Sibia. Mm, thanks, Chaperson. Advocate Fiduli. Uh, okay, section 62 of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa acknowledges that indigenous languages are facing a challenge of diminishing and thus requires the state to take practical steps and positive measures to elevate their status and advance the use of these languages. Mm. The question is, what is your op opinion on this section? The second one, what measures would you put in place to ensure that the state, including provinces and municipalities, comply fully with these constitutional requirements? I thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. I think my, my opinion with regards to this uh, important provision, the constitution, is that there is an obligation, a constitutional obligation um, on the state to ensure that um, um, uh, practical steps and positive measures are taken to ensure that uh, all languages uh, received uh, parity in terms of use and are equitably used. And, and I want to say this also and give a background that if you look at the entire framework of the Bill of Rights, they are centered around language. For you to be able to receive a fair trial, language. For you to be able to express yourself, language. So language is very critical. And that's why then this provision finds itself in the Constitution. So we need to make sure that uh, we set up uh, plans in place to ensure that languages, particularly those languages that were previously undermined and not used uh, fully, uh, we need to put programs in place uh, to make sure that uh, we 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 elevate the status of those of those languages to 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 all South Africans, uh, uh, chair So I think I think um, chair, I may have missed this, the second question. I will just focus on the second question. If you can please uh, repeat the second question. Okay. What measures would you put in place to ensure that the state, including provinces and municipalities? comply fully with these constitutional requirements? Well, I think the, the first measure for me, uh, Chairperson, it, 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 we would have to make sure that uh, we have a clear compliance program uh, to ensure that there's compliance uh, with these provisions. And secondly, once we have set up a compliance program, we need to ensure that there's monitoring evaluation. And in case where we pick up during monitoring evaluation that there's no compliance, we need to be able to ensure to enforce the provision of legislation. But one of the weaknesses that I've discovered is that there is no sanctions for non-compliance uh, with the provisions of, of, of these language frameworks. So we need to find a mechanism where uh, either it's a, it's a national department, either it's a provincial department or a municipality. If it doesn't comply, then we need to be able to ensure that uh, there are sanctions that are meted against and uh, that particular entity of the state. I mean, if you look at most regulatory authorities across, including the, the information regulator, there are sanctions that are imposed. If you look at the, the competition commission, if there's no compliance, there are sanctions that are imposed. So in order to make sure that we've got teeth um, uh, to ensure that there is compliance, because if you read the, the, the annual report of the board, there's this clear challenge of compliance. So, so what is missing there, Chair, is, is the enforcement. So I would, I would move that uh, there must be a mechanism, perhaps even the amendment of the legislation, to ensure that um, uh, when there is a contravention, we are able to, 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 to enforce, and, and also if there is a contravention, then we can um, uh, put sanctions against that particular state entity. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Ad Advocate Fiduli. The next honorable member is Honorable Joseph. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, Advocate Patuli. Uh, the question I would like to ask is um, around section six, sub section four of the Constitution. 
of the Republic yes. that empowers government, both provincial and national, to regulate and monitor the use of official languages to ensure that they enjoy parity of esteem and are treated equitably. Yes. What legal and operational measures would you put in place to make sure this come to into effect? Thank you. Thank you very much. As I said earlier on, I think um, it is clear that um, uh, there are compliance mechanisms that have been put in place. Uh, there's also a monitoring and evaluation mechanism which is in place. Uh, but what is missing um, is, is the proper investigation of contraventions um, of the of the police as well as the plans uh, that uh, the board would have set. And therefore, there's going to be a requirement that um, when these plans are put in place uh, by the board, uh, then there's also uh, investigations for non-compliance, but there's also sanctions for those who don't comply. So operationally, we we'll have to make sure that um, we have um, an effective and efficient board that is uh, efficient in terms of uh, setting out a strategy uh, and also an effective administration to make sure that uh, we've got clear annual performance plans, we've got quarterly report, uh, so that we're able to, to, to plan and um, uh, to enforce the provisions of the legislation. Uh, so I think that's that will be my, my approach uh, in, in a nutshell. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Advocate. The next honorable member is Honorable Zondi. As long as Salo has been elected advocate for Duli, Tambama. Angumbuzo, Orlando Live Advocate. <clears throat> Following the publication of the language statistics released by States, States South Africa for the Census 2022, Pencil has expressed some concerns about the sharp decline in the South African Sign Language. Yes. This is significant as South African Sign Language is now recognized as an official language. Additionally, Pencil highlighted the decrease in the number of Isindebele speakers in schools and noted that matric class of 2022 marked the first class without a single learner registered to learn Isiswati in the Gauteng province. The proportion of English Tsitsonga and Shivenda speakers remained relatively stable. However, the statistics show a decrease in the number of Africans and Isitsonga speakers and a decline in the use of Khoi San, of Khoi and San languages. Question, what is your analysis of this situation? If you were to be appointed to, to pencil, what measures would you put in place to ensure that indigenous language grow? Yeah, well. Thank you, thank you very much, Honorable, uh, for that uh, question. Uh, my analysis uh, is that uh, there is a challenge that uh, we are facing as a country because it's clear that there's a decline in the use of uh, official languages, uh, particularly those that we have mentioned. And therefore, we need to uh, uh, come up with mechanism to address the situation and, and arrest it. Now, uh, we, we have to actually go back to the ground in terms of the measures, because uh, we have to get the speakers of the language to actually like the language um, and begin to appreciate it so that they can use it. Uh, so, so I think that's the first thing. We need to go back to our communities and begin to 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 train, raise awareness about these languages and and their importance, and and members of the community as well must be encouraged to express themselves in these languages. And and secondly, uh, chair, we would have to go back uh, uh, to the basics, to the schools, uh, the learners. Um, what measures are in place to make sure that um, uh, these languages uh, are known that they exist, uh, and 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 that those who speak them uh, should have the confidence to use them because they are recognized. So we have to have some awareness campaigns in the schools, uh, collaborate with the Department of Education, but also I think universities have a role to play as well uh, in terms of ensuring that uh, they work with us uh, to arrest this, this situation, uh, because it, it, it's important that this becomes a, a collaborative effort uh, to ensure that um, uh, this issue is, is, is arrested. But I think overall, 
the entire uh, government has a huge responsibility to ensure that at all levels, you know, these languages are used um, uh, to communicate with the speakers of the language, should they require any information, should, 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 should there be advertisement for job opportunities, should there be any interviews whatsoever, uh, they should be able to, to, be, to, to be told up front that no, you can access um, um, uh, this information in your own official language so that you are able to understand us better. And in that way, we'll also cover you know, some of the important provisions in the Bill of Rights that you know, are tied uh, together with, with, with this, this, these rights of, of languages. So I think those would be uh, my, my, my few two cents uh, so far that question is concerned. Thank you very much. Thank you, Advocate. The next honorable member is Honorable Malomani. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Greetings to you, Advocate Toto Federal. Greetings, Honorable Malomani. Thank you. My question, it will be based on the issues of risk management as part of your key performance area as a registrar. If you were to be appointed to PENSLAP, what legal system would you put to place to ensure that fraud and corruption does not take place within the organization? Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. I think perhaps, uh, Honorable Moloman, the first thing to mention is that as a board, we would be required to develop a strategy. And once we have developed a strategy, then we need to come up with a, a risk management framework, uh, then to begin to identify the risks that might impact on us realizing our, our strategy. So I think um, that is the first thing that, that will happen. And one of the risks that face all organization is fraud. So we would have to develop a fraud policy. And once we have developed a fraud policy, we must also uh, develop a, a compliance framework, which is then going to, to allow us as a board to play an oversight uh, on the administration uh, in terms of making sure that uh, fraud risk is, is identified, fraud risk is assessed and rated, and uh, fraud risk also um, is monitored and evaluated, and controls are in place uh, to prevent uh, that uh, risk from happening. So from a board perspective, we are sitting there, we play oversight. We have to make sure that, of course, that uh, there is a policy in place in terms of uh, risk management. Uh, the, the enterprise risk management. Of course, there's also a fraud pool that is required. And then uh, the, the management then would require then on a quarterly basis to report to us in terms of uh, of uh, of risk management, including fraud, uh, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Mm. Honorable members, any member want to ask a question? Uh, thank you, honorable members. Uh, can, on behalf of uh, the members of this committee, take an opportunity to say thank you, uh, Advocate, uh, wishing you uh, the best of, of the day and wishing that uh, you must wait the results of this committee patiently. And now uh, I'm suspecting being uh, somebody has been on the field, you know uh, the processes that now after members uh, declared to the uh, ministry uh, their, their interaction and their scoring, you'll get uh, the results from the ministry. But also, can we take this opportunity to ask you to say a few words a departing one, once. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, let me first appreciate the opportunity granted to me by yourself, Chairperson, and the entire portfolio committee. And also, Chair, just to highlight the, the importance of this task uh, that uh, will be given to the board that will be appointed and uh, express that I'm ready to uh, put my two cents to contribute to the advancement of our democracy and advancement of our constitution. So I will wait patiently uh, for the result, Chair. I thank you.
<laughs> you know, uh, Advocate, uh, these members, the way that they are reacting uh, facially, they are making me to laugh. Thank you so much, Cowell. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, to the members. Thank you. Honorable members, uh, we are doing well. Uh, it's nice that sometimes we get a mixed generation in the, in this process uh, in order that we must feel that you are on duty. <laughs> um, now the next uh, MM candidate is going to be Advocate Janssen. Uh, uh, Advocate Janssen, uh, are you on that platform? Mm. Yes, I am. Good day, Honorable Chair. Yes, hey. I, am. I was worried about you. My office was worried about you. Thank you that we are here. Uh, we have been not getting hold of you. How come? The, the 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 rock uh, of the country no don't 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 respond what i'm just happy that now we are here yes okay. um, can i take this opportunity to tell you that these are members of parliament but uh, the members of parliament they are uh, the members of the portfolio in the department of sport arts and culture we are having a they all uh, encourage of uh, administration. Uh, it's here. Uh, we have secretariat. We, we have got um, the um, the content advisor. The <laughs> the. Researchers, advocate. I'm suspecting uh, now, even the chairperson, she's a bit tired. But I'll, I'll try to boost myself. Uh, maybe by you, when you're answering, you'll make me to be sharp than than this. But also, can we take this opportunity to give to you to introduce yourself? I thank you. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, Honourable Member and Honourable Members. Uh, all protocols observed. Uh, I'm so sorry about uh, the logistics of getting hold of me. I didn't realise that was happening, although I've just been quite busy with my, my full-time employment. So I hope the committee accepts my apologies. Uh, I'm Leslie Janssen. Uh, I'm based in Cape Town. I live on the Cape Flats. I'm uh, part of the Koi Koi community. I'm formerly a trained lawyer. Um, I got my qualifications in the Western Cape, but there's quite a journey that I had to follow to where I am today. But uh, I'm essentially just a South African trying to be in service for our country and doing my little small part towards its success. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, thank you, Advocate. Um, may I now give to the members to ask questions, uh, Honorable Adams. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson, and good afternoon to um, Advocate uh, Johnson. My question to you, uh, Advocate, will be explain why the Pan South Africa Language Board should have a member with legal expertise. If you were to be appointed to the board, what role will you play at council? I thank you. 
Thank you very much for that question, Honorable Member. Um, why a person with legal expertise? Um, I think I bring the benefit of both a, a member of a speech community that are wanting our language to be officially recognized. And secondly, I've been involved in advocacy work around the uh, cultural rights and land and environmental rights for uh, many of the speech communities that are affected by the work of Pansal. Um, so I think to bring that uh, legal background to this uh, area of language, which is also an important area of law, um, I think would be could be a valuable um, contribution, I'm hoping. And uh, my role that I, that I see is I just try to be useful generally in everything I do. Um, I think my role would be the fact that I've got uh, a background of working with Indigenous communities across Southern Africa, uh, supporting them around many of their land, cultural resource rights. Uh, language was always a, a, a secondary issue related to these issues, but I, th I think it's important from that experience that I've gained to also see how do we, how do we incorporate and integrate language much more uh, as part of the broader land and resource rights of communities, which would be your speech communities. And I think I would like my role to be to, to help cement that, to strengthen uh, uh, PANSOP's work, hopefully. That is sort of how I'm, how I'm looking at, at my role. Thank you, member. Thank you, advocate. I've forgotten to tell uh, you, it's unfortunate that every... Um, um, don't, uh, every candidate is got 45 minutes. Thank you so much for uh, answering this question. Uh, the next honorable member is Sibia. Thanks, Chairperson. Greetings to Advocate Jansen. Section 6.2 of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa acknowledges that indigenous languages are facing a challenge of diminishing and thus requires the state to take practical steps and positive measures to elevate their status and advance the use of these languages. The question is, what is your opinion on this section? The other one. What measures would you put in place to ensure that the state, including provinces and municipalities, comply fully with this constitutional requirement? I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Member, for that question. Uh, the steps I think the state should take towards Section 2, firstly, I think it is encouraging to have that statement already at the advent of our democratic dispensation in our constitution. Uh, but of course, we're all here because it needs to go further. Uh, the Koi and San communities' languages uh, I would see Pansop's role primarily being to understand how does it get it to official language status. Uh, and to see how do we strengthen the implementation of that official recognition within our uh, sphere of our society and our public service, particularly. I think in terms of how I would advise the country come in compliance with Section 2 by bringing those uh, the Koi and San communities' languages to official status and ensure that it's protected would firstly be in line with how the African Commission have uh, set the policy framework in place. And on this very issue, it gives very important guidance, namely that uh, these communities uh, do need what they call special measures. And whilst by that it's meant not more rights than others, but that the state puts measures in place, particular to their situation, to ensure that these communities are able to access their rights on par with others. And what that would practically mean for us in this room would basically to understand the composition of Queen Sound communities in South Africa, how they themselves like define themselves and in, in partnership with them work out a process on how to firstly obtain their uh, 
their inputs, their free prior informed consent, and work out a roadmap based on how these communities living customary law is defined in partnership with them, uh, walk this roadmap together towards official recognition of their languages. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the next question, uh, it's coming from Honorable Joseph. Thank you, Chairperson, and good afternoon, Advocate um, Jensen. Uh, my question relates to, or refers to Section 6, Subsection 4 of the Constitution that empowers government, both national and provincial, to regulate and monitor the use of official languages to ensure that they enjoy parity of esteem and are treated equitably. What legal and operational measures would you put in place to make this to come into effect. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I think there's a few things that should happen, but uh, as a kickoff, uh, the for me, the beginning is, is always the official recognition that we should put in place, um, as I've outlined in the previous answer, and I think also, secondly, what would be equally important would be that uh, it become mainstream within our schools. Uh, it's very important that uh, our language is taught in uh, by the, the speech community members as far as possible. Or we have to determine how do we actually integrate this knowledge uh, and this language as part of um, our school curriculum for our, our communities. So that would be a critical first step uh, uh, from, my, from my side. And secondly, I would say also our municipalities would play a very important role if we talk about the district development model. Uh, that would be the starting point uh, as the as a state that sort of has to, where all of our legal frameworks in a sense integrate, that would be the, the level, the local level at which each municipality should do some form of a needs assessment to understand where these speech communities are living within uh, their local uh, municipalities, what are their needs there too, and how could the municipality, as that first government uh, line of defense, as we would almost say, or at least the, the most direct level along alongside your traditional leaders, how these um, needs assessments are actually developed and understood to ensure that implementation uh, of their language rights, we at least understand what those issues are and so that the appropriate plans as part of our district development could be uh, realized. Those are some of the initial thoughts. Uh, it's not the full answer, but that would be how I would start to think of, of this conversation. Thank you. Of section 6.4. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you so much, honorable members. This is the first person I'm hearing talking about district uh, model, which is uh, within uh, our ourselves, which we know. Um, the next honorable member is honorable Zondi. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, Advocate Jansen. Your next question, Honorable Johnson, or, or, or Advocate Johnson, following the publication of the language statistics released by State South Africa for the Census 2022, PENSAL has expressed some concerns about the sharp decline in South African sign language. This is significant as South African sign language is now recognized as an official language. Additionally, Pencil highlighted the decrease in the number of Isindebele speakers in schools and noted that the metric class of 2022 marked the first class without a single learner registered to learn Isiswati in the Gauteng province alone. The proportion of English, Chisonga and Shivenda speakers has remained relatively stable. However, the statistics, the statistics show a decrease in the number of Africans and Sikhosa speakers and a decline in the use of Khoi and San languages. 
Your question, therefore, what is your analysis of this situation? If you were to be appointed to pencil, what measures would you put in place to ensure that indigenous language grow? Thank you. Thank you so much for the question, honorable member. Um, ensuring that our languages grow um, definitely depends on I, I went through, had a, a look through the strategic uh, plan also for PANSAB, and I think it is also included in there, and I think it was also recorded this uh, very issue. Um, I think it, our, our 12 official languages is for me a, a form of restoration after our brutal history. And I think it should remain a priority for not only Pansal, but Pansal in partnership with, with our whole state. Um, I also see this as us as a society needs to continuously, um, I think, stay abreast uh, and know the heartbeat of our people. Um, it would be important for me as a beginning in terms of the stats that you've just mentioned to, um, if we want to work out a plan to probably do an assessment of that data, really to understand what are the root causes uh, of, uh, uh, of those statistics. And I wouldn't want to um, hold myself out as an expert in terms of that statistics that's been complied, uh, that's been uh, set up. But I think it would be important for us to go back to the drawing board and understand uh, what are the root causes behind those languages. Um, we do have, obviously, the Kohen San languages that are not official languages, which makes the decline even more uh, prevalent. Uh, the other languages that are official languages that are not uh, recognized uh, and implemented, and we need to look th through that assessment, what are those barriers and how do we overcome those barriers, would be my starting point for that. Thank you, member. Also, Madam Chair, I must apologize, but people keep on referring to me as an advocate. Uh, I'm not a practicing advocate. I'm an admitted attorney. So my apologies uh, for that confusion. Thank you. Thank you so much about that correction. Uh, Honorable Malomane, thank you so much. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Greetings to you, Advocate Johnson. My question it will be, if you were to be up if you were to be appointed to Penslav, advocate, oh, sorry, advocate, sorry, my apology, advocate. It's Ms. Jensen, sorry. Because I can see in your CV you've got legal uh, experience. If you were to be appointed to Penslav, what legal systems would you put to place to ensure that fraud and corruption does not take place within the organization? Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Madam, Madam uh, Honorable Member, for that question. What may legal measures I would put in place to ensure that fraud uh, does not take place? In my view, um, I think we can always improve on systems and legislation that we have in place. But for me, it is oftentimes the implementation of those laws. Um, I think it would just be important to assess um, where PANSOB's uh, compliance uh, in terms of uh, implementation of those laws and application of those laws of PANSAB uh, is falling short. Um, if the case of fraud, if there are cases of fraud, then I think the proper assessment of the systems and the application thereof needs to be uh, assessed. I know I'm referring a lot to assessments, but uh, I do believe in South Africa we do have good laws, but oftentimes those laws and policies fall short at the point of application um, and accountability uh, of people that are uh, not in compliance of the law. So for me, it would be assessing where the implementation uh, is falling short because I do believe our country have very good laws to, as a system, our rule of law, um, it's all there. Uh, but how does implementation take place would perhaps be where, where I would start. Thank you, Honorable Member. Uh, thank you uh, so much, Ms. Janssen. Uh, we are taking uh, this opportunity to check with Honorable Members whether we still want 
to ask questions to Ms. Janssen. In that note, let's take this uh, opportunity. I am taking it on behalf of the committee members, thanking you to come. Uh, we did hear your apology uh, that you were having problem because you you are you were at work. Thank you uh, to have time to come. But also, we are hoping that uh, you will be here very soon. The results of these interviews. You are not alone. You you are twenty five in all. So hoping for the best that uh, uh, you can be amongst those who can be taken. But also, can I give you the opportunity uh, to say something to, to us as honorable members? I thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I think now from my side, um, it's just uh, to say thank you to the members for this opportunity. And uh, I would like to say even if uh, no matter what the outcome is, I'm still available to assist uh, or support because I think the work of PANSOP is very important. Uh, it is vital that we grow all indigenous languages in our country. Uh, it's also it's for the development of our youth and our children. So I'm available to assist in any way, uh, notwithstanding the outcome of the application. So all of the best with your process going forward. Thank you. Thank you, go well. We are releasing you. Thank you so much. Bye. Honorable Mem members, the, the next um, candidate is asking for 10 minutes to set, to set uh, yes. a, a, a Simpson uh, after 10 minutes, uh, he's going to be with us. He asked 10. But you have we have got uh, the third group uh, on the list. This is the third group. No, no, he's getting good.
Miss Simpson. Miss Simpson. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Afternoon. Uh, honorable members, please come in. Okay. No, we were waited for you. You asked 10 minutes now. Members were just out next door. They are coming back. Miss Simpson. Oh, yes. All right. I think, uh, thank okay. you so much for accommodating me. I was just outside of my house. So oh, I needed okay. to get back into the complex and inside my house. So, yeah. Sure. No, no, <laughs> but thank no, you so much. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable members, uh, I'm starting, uh, members, if they don't want now to comply, I'm starting without themselves. Uh, the first honorable member uh, uh, who knows, she knows that he, she is here. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Ms. Simpson. Uh, here we are, this, these are our honorable members of parliament serving in the Committee of Sport, Arts and Culture. Uh, now you are going to answer questions from themselves, but first and foremost, we do welcome you, and then uh, we love you uh, that you can tell uh, us about yourself, but you must not forget that we have your CV with us. Uh, you can, uh, have, you do have five minutes, you can exceed you cannot exceed and you can take less less uh, five minutes, but the whole uh, interview is on 45 minutes. I thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to be interviewed by the uh, Portfolio Committee. Um, my name is Clarinda Simpson. I'm a chartered accountant. I am a person that has worked in public sector uh, my entire career. I started off as um, an auditor at the Auditor General's Office, auditing uh, state-owned institutions. And um, I went up to the level of senior manager and then I crossed over into the finance field. So I, I've been a finance executive for at least 14 years. 
uh, as a chief financial officer in state-owned companies, in public entities, um, a constitutional institution as well at ICASA. And um, I've also sat on uh, various uh, boards of uh, state-owned companies, uh, Schedule 2, Schedule 3Bs, uh, Schedule 3A. And uh, I'm quite conversant with the uh, governance uh, in public sector, as well as um, uh, when it comes to complying with the, the Companies Act, the PFMA, the Treasury regulations, and um, various other um, government legislation that is applicable to, to public uh, entities or state-owned entities. So um, I'm hoping that um, I can add a value or uh, my responses to questions during this process will give an insight into my knowledge when it comes to governance, all the different aspects of governance that I believe I'm okay with. And um, yes, um, I think I will leave it there. That is um, me uh, on a high level. Uh, you've got my detailed CV as you've mentioned. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Simpson. Uh, Honorable Van Dijk. Thank you, Chair, and welcome, Ms. Simpson. My question is as follow. Um, give us your understanding of the importance of having at least one board member with financial management, management expertise. If you were to be appointed to the board, what role would you play in relation to the existing financial operations? Okay. So thank you for the question. Um, you cannot have a board that um, is comprised of uh, members um, that um, uh, are not um, uh, financial experts or qualified, uh, can we call it, financial um, accountants or, or chartered accountants. So it is very important to have a board member that has financial expertise. So um, when I say financial expertise, it's financial expertise from an executive level so that one understands the board's requirements uh, when it comes to um, complying with the uh, governance requirements around financial management in terms of the PFMA. So a board without uh, a finance professional or a chartered accountant uh, or some sort of registered uh, professional accountant is a board that would be extremely lacking in terms of governance. Because governance doesn't just follow um, focus on the the core mandate of an entity; it focuses on different aspects, um, including financial management, uh, as you've rightly mentioned, uh, including other aspects like um, human resources, um, legal, um, ethics, social aspects. So, um, financial management is at the top of governance requirements in terms of public finance management. And um, I believe that if I were appointed with my um, extensive experience as an executive um, in finance, as well as a non-executive director sitting on various boards and uh, sitting in audit committees, especially, I know the importance of having the financial skills, the financial qualifications, and also having the audit expertise, which um, I have and which I've also gained from my time or tenure at the Office of the Auditor General. So the value add that comes from having um, a financial expert or slash uh, auditor, because one has to wear both hats when you're sitting at a board level, is that you know the audit requirements. Uh, you are able to oversee internal audit, external audit. You are able to oversee compliance with the Public Finance Management Act. You are able to oversee compliance with the triple PFA, which is the regulations governing public sector procurement. You are able to um, add value. A, a board is not just there to, uh, you know, wield the, the, the whip or the stick, but also to ensure that they add value, transfer skills. So having my, my immense skills and experience from uh, the various boards that I've sat on and also being a CFO in public sector myself, I know exactly what is required at a board level, what is required to comply with the PFMA, what is required for quarterly reporting, what is required for audit purposes, preparation of for, for the external audit, uh, coordination between internal audit, external audit, and also the importance of collaborating with internal audit. So that is uh, uh, the, the value add that I would bring 
to the Board of Penself if I had to be appointed as a chartered accountant. Um, I do note uh, that uh, the, I think the previous board, uh, I don't know if there was any um, financial expert there, but looking at the audit outcome, um, I think it's, it's minor issues that could have been avoided if there was a bit of proactiveness f uh, um, inside the institution when it came to correction of uh, those um, those errors. Uh, you can see the repetitive findings coming from previous years as well. And uh, 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 issues that could have been avoided if there were proper policies and procedures governing procurement and proper understanding of um, uh, uh, deviations, for example, in procurement, um, uh, if there was proper understanding of accounting standards. I mean, GRAP is, is something that is applicable to Schedule 3A entities. So compliance with GRAP is absolutely essential. Having regular updates on an annual basis, refresher courses with regard to the new developments in accounting standards absolutely critical to comply with the GRAP accounting framework when it comes to Schedule 3As. So you can see there's a lack of uh, that sort of um, um, uh, updates uh, from a management perspective when it comes to um, the, the auditing of the financial statements and ultimately the audit outcome for 22-23. So um, as a chartered accountant, as an auditor by profession, of, as a financial executive, as a non-executive director, having chaired audit and risk committees, finance committees, I believe I can bring immense value and uh, assistance to management uh, and guide them as well um, in terms of the requirements of the Public Finance Management Act and the relevant accounting framework that the entity has to comply with. So um, I think I will stop there, uh, if that is okay. <laughs> Thank you, it's fine. Uh, the next Honourable Member is uh, Honourable Chief Lutuli. Thank you, Chair. Uh, afternoon. Uh, Good afternoon. Uh, what is your understanding of the public of the Public Finance Management Act? Act like Act Number Twenty Nine of Nineteen Ninety Nine. How would you, you ensure that? It is applied by the pen cell. Okay, so my understanding of the Public Finance Management Act is that the, the PFMA was brought in in, in, in 1999 to govern uh, public finance administration in public sector because of the various um, loopholes, gaps, and um, uh, issues that were emanating from um, uh, public uh, uh, finance uh, um, management in, in various entities. So my understanding is that it is there to assist um, management, especially um, with regard to the, the relevant sections, like starting from Section 54, um, um, Schedule 3A entities, uh, it guides you in terms of what you need to do internally, in terms of uh, making sure you've got a qualified uh, um, a CFO to support your CEO, a qualified a CFO with the right experience that's going to assist in making sure there's proper financial administration in the institution. Um, it's uh, it's there to ensure that it it, it, it guides you and it, it tells you, uh, please comply uh, with, uh, with me as the PFMA in terms of uh, compiling and implementing policies and procedures to guide you your, your operational activities, not just in from a finance perspective, but just general across the board uh, to gov you know to make sure that operations function well within the organization. Um, so um, it's there to manage revenue. There mustn't be um, abuse of revenue, be it uh, government grants that are given to the organization or revenue that is generated by the organization itself. It's there to manage expenditures, to make sure that expenditures are not... Um, abused, uh, there's no unnecessary, fruitless and wasteful expenditures, there's no losses. Um, and if those occur, it requires you to report it so that there's accountability, there's uh, a proper uh, management and consequence management related to, to officials that are responsible for um, ensuring compliance to the PFMA in their day-to-day -day 
uh, duties or activities. So it's 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 a very good act, and it was a very good initiative coming from government to implement it. It also uh, uh, gives guidelines on how to manage your your assets, your liabilities, uh, etc. In um in 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 state owned institutions, uh, it's there to to make sure that there's no abuse of government funds. Uh, most institutions. Uh, in public sector are funded by the fiscus. So it's there to ensure that taxpayers' money is not um, unnecessarily defrauded or, or, or wasted, you know, uh, by um, public servants. And the one thing I like about the PFMA is its um, focus on consequence management, that people must be held to account. So uh, that it de- deters a, a, a reoccurrence of these offences or non-compliance of the PFMA um, going forward. So there's no repetition, which has a, a very negative impact on any grant funding or any donations. And it also affects your annual report, which is subject to reading by the public. So if the, the reader of the annual report sees a qualified or uh, um, uh, uh, opinion or an opinion that is sort of modified by fruitless and wasteful or irregular expenditure, it's not a nice reflection uh, uh, for the institution and it, it, the perception that the reader gets is not something that is um, a good. So the fact that you implement consequence management to deal with transgressors is something that is welcomed in public sector. Uh, how would I ensure it's applied? Um, uh, it's, it's applied in, in, in public sector institutions um, by incorporation of those sections of the PFMA that are applicable to an entity. They are included in uh, the policies and procedures of an organization. Compliance with the PFMA is not something that you do once or for annually. It's something that is done on a day-to-day basis during performance of operations and activities within the organization by staff. So including it in policies and procedures and standard operating procedures is very critical to ensure that on a day-to-day basis, monthly basis, quarterly basis, you're complying with the PFMA. And you also implement checklists uh, so those sections of the PFMA that are applicable to various divisions within the institution, you have checklists and you monitor compliance to those sections of the PFMA on a monthly basis and you report back internally to relevant committees internally on your compliance. And if you're not complying, then you need to find mitigations and measures to, to, to close the gap and ensure that going forward you do comply. So uh, you also make use of your internal audits internally you know, as an internal audit assurance provider to give you comfort and assurance that in their internal audit plan, they must focus on incorporating an audit that looks at compliance internally in the institution with not just the PFMA, but the entire compliance uh, universe or regulatory universe because PFMA and there's a whole lot of other acts that are also applicable to state-owned institutions that one needs to comply with. And it can become overwhelming if you don't have the proper processes and controls in place to ensure compliance and reporting uh, any non-compliance or deviations and then the mitigations or the, the measures to actually correct that deviation going forward. So reporting it at um, a management committee level, executive committee level, if you've deviated or not complied, um, based on your checklist. Um, internally that you've got on a monthly basis is important. Then you've got uh, your your finger on the pulse. You are monitoring on a monthly basis. You can correct it the next month to make sure that there's no accumulation of non-compliance. And then you get material uh, non-compliance at the end of the year if you do not catch it early. And um, reporting it at a governance committee level is also very important so that uh, you are basically capacitating the board to make the right decisions and also to give you the guidance on how to comply going forward if you're struggling with interpreting a section uh, that you need to comply with. And also the board can advise or, and the governance committees on the tools you can implement to, com- to ensure compliance going forward. So um, that is how the PFMA, um, or I would ensure the um, compliance uh, to the PFMA. And I must say that um, having external audits, being the AGSA, is, is, is very uh, comforting and, and assuring. I will always advocate for having interim audits where the AG can come in and take stock, you know, first six months into the financial year of what's happening in an institution 
am I on the right track in terms of complying with relevant uh, legislation applicable to the entity? Am I complying with the main act that governs me as a, a, a public entity, which is the PFMA? And um, getting feedback from the AG in that regard uh, during the first six months of the financial year so that you can implement corrective action before the end of the financial year is also something uh, that is a value add coming from the AG and something I would um, sort of uh, encourage and insist on um, yeah, as as um, as um, if I'm sitting on on the board, sitting um, uh, on a governance committee, there must be that communication and agreement and oversight and assistance with regard to making sure that management uh, gets the most out of external audits, not just uh, modified audit opinions and qualifications, but there's a value add aspect that external auditors need to 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 add to any audit. So um, I would say. If I was sitting on 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 pencil board on any committee, uh, even if it's legal um, compliance uh, governance committee, I will follow that route in ensuring that um, there's compliance with the PFMA and people are held to account. And um, when when I say held to account, non-compliance must be reported. It must be investigated to see whether it was deliberate whether it was negligence or whether it was the fact that people just don't know that they need to comply. And then if they don't know, you implement training. If it's negligence, there's consequence management. Or And if it's deliberate, then it's a, a more severe sanction that one needs to implement. Accountability is key, and it's what is advocated for in the PFMA. So, so that is uh, compliance and ensuring compliance so that you do not have, uh, a, on a bigger scale, you know, non-compliance. And it also eventually links back you know, to the audit outcome where you have uh, these very nasty audit outcomes or audit opinions and a whole list of non-compliance paragraphs in the audit report. You don't want to go there. So um, it's not a good reflection uh, when it comes to the reader of the, the annual report. So um, I, I would leave it there and say that's the role Ms. I would Simpson? Say. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Simpson. Simpson, I want to remind you uh, you know, uh, I've seen you answer this question with passionate. You must not <laughs> forget that. <laughs> you must not forget that. Also, you do have forty-five minutes, and uh, there are still questions which are coming. But really, uh, it's it's part uh, of you. I've seen <laughs> that we are going on and on. It's good. Uh, we're getting lessons even our good self. The next uh, uh, honourable member is Honourable Sibia. Thanks, Chairperson. Uh, welcome, uh, Ms. Simpson. What is your understanding of the internal audit and enterprise risk management? The second one, how would you apply this to Penn South African language board. Thank you. Uh, my understanding of internal audit. Um, internal audit is an internal control mechanism. So internal audit function is there to support um, the institution, is there to support management. So internal audit, um, it's, first of all, it, um, it comes up with an audit plan based on a risk assessment. So there's a risk assessment that is done so internal audit and, and enterprise risk management are interlinked. The one cannot work without the other because the internal audit is based on the risks that are identified via the enterprise risk management um, wide framework because uh, you basically plan for your audits based on the risks that have been identified by management and by uh, internally and also that are approved at a, at a board level. So um, they, they audit... Um, areas that are of high risk as determined by the institution. They also um, uh, audit the controls in an institution. Uh, and that's their key focus. Um, it's mainly to audit controls to make sure that they are working. Uh, controls can uh, comprise uh, policies, procedures, and other other means uh, of, 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 of all sorts of controls like frameworks, and then, um, or, or basically charters um, or, or SOPs, et cetera, standard operating procedures. So um, they always audit compliance or adherence 
to those sort of um, control mechanisms and they report on a quarterly basis to the Audit and Risk Committee. They are they report functionally to the Audit and Risk uh, Committee and administratively to the accounting officer in a, a state-owned institution. So the uh, functions are also guided and uh, uh, by the Audit and Risk Committee, which uh, sort of gives some sort of uh, independence to to internal audit, and um, therefore they are very objective when it comes to the auditing of um, uh, internally before there's an external audit. So the the internal audit uh, is supposed to be a proactive means of preventing severe or negative audit outcomes um, of, of from the external audit, for example. So that's why internal audit is, 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 is based within the institution. And it's it's auditing based on an audit plan and it audits the entire year. You know, different uh, uh, areas within the organization. It can be finance, it can be, it ranges from finance or human resources, um, IT, all the different, uh, even the core divisions are also subject to uh, auditing by internal audit. So it's um, it's a control mechanism. It's a proactive measure to limit negative audit outcomes coming from the external auditors. And they are also there to co co, co collaborate and coordinate with external audit to make sure that external audit um, is also limited in terms of their um, scope. For example, um, if the if internal audit uh, um, outcomes are that internal controls are adequate and they're effective, they're working, and they are assisting the organization in um, in achieving, you know, there's full compliance and uh, delivery and uh, reporting is 100% uh, compliant with legislation and, and, and accounting frameworks, then it sort of uh, improves the external audit outcome. And um, when they co coordinate and collaborate with the AG, it's to limit the extent of the work of, of the AG, and it also helps in limiting the, the external audit fee. I mean, Cancel is a very uh, financially constrained organization. So to have that measure in place where there's coordination and collaboration to limit the, the scope of external audit and therefore the audit fee is helpful. Um, enterprise risk management. Um, you need um, enterprise risk management um, policies, procedures, and frameworks, first of all, to guide enterprise risk management. So enterprise risk management talks about risk management holistically within the organization. So you will have a chief risk officer, but he's not the only one responsible for risk. It basically means that every official, every manager, every executive within the organization is responsible for identification of risks in their day-to-day -day duties and operational activities and reporting of such risks and also being proactive in coming up with mitigations to uh, ensure that those risks uh, do not uh, materialize, therefore negatively impacting the organization. So that is enterprises management. And it's also uh, uh, required and best practice to have um, an internal risk management committee comprised of management that meets monthly, assesses risks uh, and the controls which are subject to audit by internal audit and also the ratings of those risks and then eventually the residual risks uh, that are calculated after you apply the controls. So that should be done on a monthly basis. It should be reported quarterly as well to audit and risk committee. And then um, the, the, the top 10, 11, 12 risks that look at your strategic risks uh, and uh, whether they are basically preventing you from achieving your strategic objectives, those should go to the board and the board should be familiar with them and actually uh, you know, have oversight over them and whether they're changing or in terms of becoming more risky or whether their ratings are, are being managed and they're going uh, lower in terms of being risk, uh, risky. So that is enterprise risk management. And, and that's how I would apply it um, within pen, PenSelp. Um, I've had the opportunity of being a CFO slash CRO at one of my previous employers. So I've basically managed the risk management process. Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, yeah, I'm very okay with the processes involved. And you must have a, a risk toler tolerance level and an appetite level as well. So where your controls are inadequate, you must make sure you have additional actions to co compensate for that. And you must, those additional actions are like little other compensating controls that you also need to audit and follow up on to manage your risk. Can you leave it there because there are other questions? <laughs>
I don't want to, to miss out on the other questions. But you cannot avoid because it's your specialist. <laughs> <laughs> the passion that you are having. Uh, thank you, um, Ms. Simpson. And then uh, the next honorable member is Honorable Zondi. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon to Ms. Simpson. Hey, your next question will be, if you were to be appointed to SAMSA, what steps would you take to ensure that fraud and corruption does not take place within the organization? Thank you. Okay, so if uh, I was appointed to the board uh, of PANSAB, I would, um, first of all, familiarize myself with the um, the relevant charters of the board of the um, relevant go governance committees and uh, make sure that there is proper oversight over fraud at a board level, that um, um, steps or management of fraud and corruption is incorporated in the governance uh, committee charters and also in the board charters. So the first uh, point of departure is um, to manage fraud and corruption. You must have your fraud and corruption um, uh, prevention uh, call it plan or framework, and then or, or uh, framework and then a policy, and um, there must be um, an implementation plan uh, of uh, to ensure that um, you know there are proper controls and measures in place to prevent fraud and corruption. You don't want to give people an opportunity to commit fraud. You have to be proactive and ensure there are controls in place to prevent it. And um, what also goes along with um, that is training uh, staff or employees on your fraud um, and corruption uh, policies, procedures, frameworks, and the processes and measures you've put in place. For example, whistleblowing. Uh, all staff must know that there's a whistleblowing function. You know, where people, if they've come across fraud in the institution, they can report it anonymously without fear, you know, uh, or being um, um, subject to, um, you know, um, sort of a victimization. So having a whistleblowing hotline is very comforting to employees because then they report anonymously and they get feedback and then there's also investigations. And sometimes a small little element of fraud can, you know, uh, give some insight into something big that's going on in the organization. Also, code of ethics is very important. People must be ethical. If you are ethical uh, uh, and you know what ethics means, then it will prevent fraud and corruption in an institution. So having a code of ethics where people must be trained on it, uh, not just internal staff, but also uh, people that you collaborate with and also your suppliers, um, yeah, and, and stakeholders uh, should be aware. I mean, uh, it's, 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 it's actually best practice. And um, also um, conflict of interest. People must declare annually, especially if they own companies, because um, you find that people um, will be asked to sit on a bid uh, uh, evaluation committee and eventually the, 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 the contract is awarded to a company that they have a, 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 a percentage ownership in. And that is illegal. So uh, a declaration uh, of interest is, is, is something that must be done by all staff on, a, on an annual basis. So conflict of interest policy must also be in place and people must be trained on it. And uh, also before you have any bid committees or any sort of committees or, or meetings that take place internally, you must declare whether you're conflicted or not, even at a board level uh, and recuse yourself, which is the right thing to do. Um, so I, I believe those are the, the, the steps to ensure fraud, uh, prevention of uh, 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 fraud and corruption. And uh, internal audit also comes in there where they also make sure there's compliance and adherence to those uh, fraud and prevention uh, policies and frameworks that have been implemented in the organization because it's a, it's a focal point for the AG. The, 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 one of the first points of, of departure for them when they're doing their planning is a fraud questionnaires, which they always target the uh, executives uh, first and then managers, you know, to ask them a whole lot, host of questions around fraud. Because uh, sometimes you can be sitting at a management level and you don't know that a particular action could be a sign that or a signal that fraud is happening in the institution. Because in institutions, there's a lot of collusion uh, and, and, and therefore overriding of control. So internal audit is very important in that regard. So uh, uh, consequence management is a given because the PFMA advocates for 
where there's fraud and corruption and you've picked it up and you've identified the culprits, please imp- implement consequence management, corrective measures. It's a, it's, it serves as a precedent and it discourages fraud and corruption from happening going forward into the future. So staff become aware, you know. So um, I, will, I will leave it there. Thank you, um, sir, for the question. Thank you, thank you so much, the Honourable Member who must ask the question is Honourable Joseph. Thank you, uh, Chairperson, and good afternoon, Ms. Uh, Simpson. Um, the question is as follows. Amongst the powers and functions of PENSOP is to actively promote and develop development of uh, previously marginalised languages in South Africa. If you are appointed to the board, how would you ensure that PENSOP ex- execute this mandate? Thank you. Okay, so if um, I was uh, appointed to the board, so development of previously marginalized languages, uh, I would ensure that, first of all, um, there is awareness and, and, and advo- advocacy campaigns um, to basically make people aware of all the different uh, languages, be it the official languages and the other uh, languages over and above the official languages that are used in uh, South Africa. So um, to make people understand uh, what multilingual, yeah, multilingualism means is very important. You know the use of of many languages. So to um, to ensure development of previously marginalized l- languages, I would make sure that um, there's a language policy put in place. In fact, I would make sure that it's actually put in the scrap plan or the APP, and it actually forms part of the targets that the organization needs to achieve uh, on an annual or regular basis. So um, that language policy will talk to what needs to basically be implemented, be it at a national, provincial, or um, uh, a local uh, municipality uh, a government level in terms of language policies um, that talk to uh, that uh, talk to previously marginalized uh, languages and encourage the use of those languages, be it in the workplace or, um, you know, just in society to make sure there's uh, social cohesion and inclusivity. Um, It's also um, a sign that um, if you use many languages, especially your previously marginalized languages, it's also a sign that uh, people respect uh, the use of not just English but other languages, and you respect uh, other people's uh, cultures if they choose to talk a language other than uh, English. You know, you can't have one language that dominates um, in 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 a country. And having those skills of being able to interact with people with on various languages is actually something that um, is 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 encouraging. And um, it promotes diversity when it comes to languages. And it actually gives you skills to uh, cope, be it uh, in society, in the workplace, and also to promote your own economic development as a person. So that is what I would uh, advocate for as a board board member when it comes to development of previously uh, marginalized languages. And I would make make sure that there's use made of the relevant structures within the pen cell like, for example, your national language uh, bodies, your provincial language committees, and your NLUs, the lexical um, units that are based at the, the, the universities, that they properly uh, give advice to the board in terms of languages, because they are responsible for promoting multilingualism, and uh, they must give feedback to the board in terms of where there are gaps and they must assist in developing those uh, previously marginalized languages. So to get report back from those structures and to get guidance from those structures on the way forward in terms of how to improve, um, I think is critical uh, as a board member. So I would advocate and encourage that and I would actually implement some monitoring tools to make sure that that is happening on a regular basis, that they are reporting back and giving guidance to the board in terms of um, developing these marginalized, uh, previously marginalized languages. 
so that they do not become extinct. And to some extent, there are records of these languages, even if they are taped and stored somewhere, uh, because now you, you might find that um, people, um, you know, as, but what is it, as you go through the generations, the, um, the indigenous languages uh, are no longer being so uh, utilized, you know, uh, Different generations, and uh, but you you must make sure that you you you've got at least dictionaries, you've got terminologies, um, and you've got some record base of all the languages that existed at some point uh, in in the country. And um, if something a language is becoming extinct, then make efforts to actually develop it and uh, promote it. You can have your 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 conferences. Uh, that can be run by Pencil, where they promote uh, multilingualism um, and educate people on what it means and how it benefits them to uh, be of okay with different languages and not just use one language. So uh, that's uh, basically, um, yeah, so that's basically how I would go about ensuring uh, as a board member this development of previously marginalized languages uh, at Pencil. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, now I can ask honourable members whether they do want to ask some questions, but uh, they must be aware that we have got less minutes uh, uh, whilst we will want you to say something. So, uh, honourable members, Honorable Joseph, yeah. Honorable Maloman, no, uh, you must be short and precise not to take uh, her minutes left with very few minutes in order that uh, she must respond. He may not say something if you take her minutes uh, while watching here. I don't even want to declare. Honorable uh, Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, given your experience, lengthy experience in, in, in the finance sector and in government, um, you've raised the, the, the point of consequence management. And I want to be honest, in our speeches, in parliament, in departments, all over government has been, this word is on everyone's lips, yet we, we're struggling. In your experience, what do you think we are not doing right in government, that we are not managing this consequences management properly and that we are actually sometimes going the other way instead of using consequences management to promote good governance. Thank you very much, Chairperson. That's just a moment. Don't uh, answer Honorable Maloman. Uh, I wanted that he must take both questions because uh, she's left with six minutes and uh, you see that he has, she has got a passionate about this uh, uh, part of her work. Honorable Maloman. Thank you, Chair. My question, it will be based on problem solving. I just want to find out if she is appointed as a board member and then she finds out that on her table there's a written complaint regarding the language violation right. How is she going to deal with that matter? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Um, Chair, uh, uh, I will respond um, uh, with the latter question, the problem-solving one. Um, if there's a written complaint um, that I find waiting for me if I join PANSAL as a board member, um, well, um, part of the mandate of the organisation is to have, um, um, is it linguistic human rights uh, a function or division with uh, internally? And... Um, it's it's uh, uh, a member of the public's right to complain, especially if um, they are not getting um, good service because, for example, you might find that, um, let me just use a layman's terms example, I, I go to a municipality and all the forms are written in English and they do not cater for me in KZN uh, and they are not translated to Isizulu, for example and I am a rural person and I don't understand what is on the form So, uh, because it's in English. And um, I've been taught my mother tongue is Isizulu and uh, I speak Isizulu, I write Isizulu, so I don't understand. So you can, um, 
yes, rightfully so, lodge a complaint um, with uh, PANSELP and it's the uh, responsibility of the organization to actually investigate all those complaints and to get an outcome on those um, investigations. Um, uh, based on my research that I've done, um, I do know that PANSELP can even subpoena um, um, uh, people or, or, or people involved in infringing uh, linguistic human rights, um, subpoena them to 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 investigations or hearings, etc. Et and, and basically um, hold them uh, to, uh, to account or to to remedy whatever contraventions that are existing. So um, yes, um, uh, it's not something that. Um, um, is unusual. Uh, I mean, it's within the mandate of the organization to actually address those complaints. So I would uh, inquire uh, if there's um, uh, if that complaint is on the list of complaints for that particular division internally that deals with such complaints and investigations. Uh, what is the status? What is the progress? Um, has the um, person who complained been informed of the status, the progress? Uh, are they getting um, um, feedback uh, from the organization as per their rights in terms of the constitution and uh, the ultimate outcome of uh, that investigation, that hearing, what happens to the findings, where are the findings? Uh, so those would be my questions and that's what I would expect to see and that those findings be published somewhere uh, and made available to the, um, the complainants and also there must be some sort of remedy by the uh, transgressors and that uh, those complaints are published and people get to know about uh, the, the outcomes of those uh, investigations and those findings so that they can also improve and remedy transgressions if they find themselves to be transgressing uh, people's uh, basic rights in terms of the constitution. constitution. So um, that would be my answer on that one. The consequence management lacking so it is a it is very true uh, the the statement of the the comment to say that um, even though the PFMA and other legislation Triple PFA uh, advocates for consequence management when it comes to wrongdoing, but it's lacking in organisations and you see it, especially when it comes to the investigation and follow up of irregular, fruitless, and wasteful expenditure. You would find that um, the expenditure is sitting in some register. Uh, for years and years and years without it being investigated or followed up and uh, no consequence management. And then the guilty culprits just continue transgressing and there's nothing that's that's been done to, to curb that. And the only way you can curb it is via consequence management. So if as a board member I come across such, then I must question why has this investigation not taken place? It's three years that, since this irregular expenditure, fruitless and wasteful, has been reported, why has the investigation not taken place? I would like to see a report uh, uh, as a board member as to what is being done about this uh, investigation into these irregularities. Why has, what is the root cause for the investigation not taking place? Why, ha what is the root cause for uh, the person responsible for investigations not doing their work? Because basically once you've identified uh, irregular expenditure, you must go and investigate and prove that it is indeed irregular. And then, of course, um, you know, consequence management in terms of the way forward and how to remedy prevention going forward. So those are the questions that I will ask and I will insist that there's a report, a status report on why there's a lack of investigations. When will the investigation be initiated? What are the timelines to expect an outcome? And what are the, um, uh, uh, the the procedures that are going to be put in place to actually make sure that the investigation takes place? If you are um, got capacity issues internally, are you going to outsource to? Um... In a way, I must declare because there are people out there who are watching us. We have exceeded with uh, two minutes. Uh, of your time, uh, I must declare, uh, because honorable members, they ask you further questions and not short questions. Uh, honorable members, you must take care of uh, uh, our people who are 
on the platform, try to round up, and then um, we are supposed to say, whilst we are rounding up, to say thank you so much, but also uh, you, you were supposed to ask or say something to us. I thank you. Um, and my apology that your time was taken by honorable members. I thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, must go I on, say something? Go on, go on uh, uh, say something to us. This is the, 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 this is, uh, the members of parliament uh, that are going to uh, score, doing scoring, uh, but uh, now a round off and also you must say to us what you want to say to us. Uh, go on. Uh, today this chairperson is lenient. Uh, I'm not sure we've got a lawyer here, which is a dog, <laughs> who's uh, going to fire back to myself when the parliament uh, got uh, this uh, report saying that uh, one uh, member of uh, given her two minutes extra. Uh, <laughs> it's not right. It's not allow honorable members. I thank you. Okay. So uh, just in brief, on the consequence management one, if I may, uh, lacking. So Yes, as a board member, let me round up on that one so that I don't leave it hanging for the honourable member. Um, yes, that uh, status report is very important and ensuring that investigations are initiated, timelines are given to management and report back feedback in terms of progress and what are the consequence managements recommended by uh, um, people that are doing the investigation. If um, uh, management is failing to do that, then the board must take over that responsibility. The board must actually or can um, actually um, chair or um, arrange for uh, disciplinary hearings, etc. You know, uh, if management is failing in that regard, uh, because it is the board's policies anyway. It's uh, they're responsible for 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 human resources and other policies. That thank, you, thank, you, thank you, thank you, thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We appreciate your passionate uh, about your work and these questions are getting to you and your answers, you, you, you wanted that you must be clear, that you must know that you, you know your things. Uh, can you say anything to, to these honorable members, uh, your parting words? I thank you. Okay, thank you, Honorable Chair, and thank you, hon Honorable Members. I thank you for the opportunity to be interviewed today. I believe that as a chartered accountant with over 20 years of exp exp experience in auditing and uh, public finance uh, in the public sector, that and also over five years of non-executive director experience and having chaired governance committees, I think that I can bring a lot of value to the Board of PANSOP and, and also add to diversity in terms of having a qualified chartered accountant, financial professional on the board to actually assist with compliance with financial prescripts. Thank so, you. Uh, thank, thank, you. You. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You know, you know, <laughs> you know. We do appreciate when we are looking at the very few females who are having your qualifications, and then even now. Uh, if you were having the whole day with us, we'll be enjoying and learning a lot because we are members of parliament in in all entities and through each department. Uh, this problem at PMFA, it's, it's a sore. So thank you so much. You must not feel bad, but unfortunately you have exceeded the time. Thank you very much. Go well. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for accommodating me. Keep safe and well. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Yeah. Honorable members, we are going to call now the next uh, Chibani. candidate. Uh, Chibane. 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 Yes. Chibane. Chibane. Uh, I listen. Uh, there are those who knows this language. Maloman is trying to be a, a very expert. Tell us, Maloman. <laughs> no, no, I'm saying you have been uh, always correcting us. Shibane. Thank you so much. Uh, we're still waiting uh, that he uh, must come. Oh, he, oh, what is she? Uh, she must come in. We are exposed about the languages, even our good selves as members. We can't even pronounce. <laughs> like like other um languages, but you cannot uh, pronounce when I'm saying that it we couple. We couple a mantra. So it's 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 like that. Uh, Miss Jibani, good afternoon. <laughs> afternoon, how are you? We are fine. Um, we are welcoming you as a chairperson on behalf of the committee. Uh, uh, I'm suspecting you laughing because we're trying not uh, to say Zivane in in its course, in in course language, and and this that we have said Z. So some uh, experts here were correcting us. Thank you. We are welcoming you. Uh, you are aware that today these members will fire in questions to you, but a very friendly questions. And then your CV is with us, but we are giving you a chance of telling us who are you in five minutes or less than five minutes as we are, you are having 45 minutes of answering the questions. I thank you. We are, are welcoming you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And also thank you for the effort of trying to pronounce my surname correctly. Um, I really appreciate that. So um, my name is Moraro Zivani. And I come from Limpopo, but um, I studied at VETS uh, for my tertiary uh, education. And I did my honors at UNISA. So I'm a chartered accountant and a registered auditor by profession. I'm also a business coach. 
and and I run my own firm. Um, you, you may switch your your. Miss, I also Miss, provide pre issuance services Bani, to the auditor. Mr. Bani, yes, you you must switch off your your video. Okay, thank uh, you. Yes. I was saying switch off your video. It is. I did that. We are listening. Thank you, Jefferson. I've just done that. Um, thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, apologies. Uh, the area that I am around at, there's load shedding, so that the quality then is being affected. But I'm sure we can continue. So um, when I was at, at Varsity, I was a founder and a deputy chairperson for a, a cultural organization that we found uh, called My Does With um, the vendor organization trying to promote uh, a vendor level, ensuring that um, the learners or the students, when they come to tertiary, do not forget where they come from. And I am also very passionate about languages. I do sometimes, uh, when called upon, try to translate uh, from English to Venda or from that to English. You know, not in the language, but because of the language, I provide that so much. Thank you so much. Uh, we do understand that you are having a lot trading and it may really cause a problem for you and for us but uh, you cannot do otherwise uh, now i'm going to give honorable members to ask you questions uh, the first honorable member is honorable van Dijk. thank you chairperson Welcome um, to the interview. My question is as follows. Give us your understanding of the importance of having at least one board member with financial management expertise. If you were to be appointed to the board, what role would you play in relation to the existing financial operations? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think we all know that uh, almost everything at the end of the day comes to finances uh, and therefore the financial management thereof is, plays a very, very vital role in running any organization. Um, it's quite important, therefore, to have somebody who understands the financial matters and the processes around finances and be able to ensure or, or over, have oversight over the uh, management um, in terms of how the finances are being run. Also ensuring that uh, the auditing, when it happens, to be able to check if um, um, uh, the organization has run itself according to what it's supposed to be, uh, it must be found to have been uh, uh, done correctly. So as an as an, a, a, an accountant and auditor as well, I'll be able to ensure that I also assist my fellow members who will not be uh, fully acquainted with finances, with that expertise, and also to understand uh, when we get reports or we have to liaise with auditors in terms of um, what uh, the things that we are getting really means and what really needs to be done to address maybe where there are issues and to address areas of improvement as well. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. The next honorable member is Honorable Chief Lutuli. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, my, my question is as follows. What is your understanding of the Public Finance Management Act? Act number 29 of 1999. How would you ensure that is the, is the, is, it is applied by the pencil? So, Thank 
Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Uh, so my understanding of the uh, PFMA is that it is there to be able to regulate the management, uh, the financial management uh, in public um, organization like government and, and provincial governments. Uh, basically, it's looking at all the aspects um, that has to deal with uh, how funds are going to be managed. That's your revenues, your expenditure, um, your budgets, um, reporting matters. And also to be able to guide in terms of who is responsible or accountable uh, for what, like the accounting officers, what are they what are they accountable for, by when and what time, uh, how we need to report, and what needs to be reported. So my role will be to ensure that um, the the PFMA is is followed upon. Um, uh, if there are any areas where there are weaknesses. Uh, those are, are identified and reports would be coming in from uh, other internal auditors or external auditors. Uh, and we need to be acting upon if, we, if, if the organization is found to be lacking in application of any of what the Act requires. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, the next honorable uh, member, it's Honorable Sibia. And thanks, Chairperson. Um, welcome, uh, Ms. Sibana. Siba. What is Thank your you. understanding of the internal audit and enterprise risk management? How would you apply this to Penn South African Labor uh, Language Board? Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Internal audit plays a very vital role in, in any organization. So internal audit will make sure that um, controls that have been um, identified as applicable to the entity um, are working, and if not, report on the weaknesses of those controls. And this will also then help to ensure that if there are any weaknesses, they can be acted upon before the external auditors could even come and, and, and check on, on the controls or areas that are lacking. Um, and so it's quite important to have a functional internal audit uh, a, a function that assists the organization in managing the controls, reporting the controls. Uh, therefore, it's important that also the audit committees, uh, which also reports to the board at the end of the day, of oversees the, the 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 efficient running of the internal audit function to ensure that controls um, are, are working. Because if controls are broken, then we will end up with all sorts of things that we do not desire. And so, the the enterprise risk management basically it's about trying and and and, and finding a method of 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 identifying the risks or things that can basically prevent the organization to achieve the objectives or strategic objectives that have been identified. So if we have a good enterprise risk management a framework in place, uh, this will help to ensure that the organization closed all the loopholes that have been identified uh, through the, those risk identification uh, to, to be able to also then open opportunities uh, to improve processes to improve how the business runs. So you close the loophole if there are any risks that you've identified and also then try to improve or, or, or gain advantage of, 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 of improving the business and, and placing it at a better place because there won't be leakages of, of things while you're trying to also improve or make the organization better. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next honorable uh, member is Honorable Zondi. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, Miss. Your next question would be, if you were to be appointed to PENSA, what steps would you take to ensure that fraud and corruption does not take place within the organization? Yabo. Thank you so much for that question. Um, I think from my point of view, the first step would be to check what is there in place already. 
because if there is something that is already in place, we want to check why is it not working and, and, and also then try to find areas of improvement for that. But more than that, um, I, I think it's also just to ensure that there are proper policies in place uh, that have to be followed and also then set the strategy as, as, as the board and develop the, the risk registers and ensure that controls um, are identified to be able to, to, to prevent uh, uh, and detect and also they manage the risks that have been identified. I think it's also very important to ensure that there's consequence management and that is actually working or effective because a lot of times uh, in, in, we talk about consequence management and nothing really happens. But it's quite important to follow up on that area to ensure that that is working. If there's any um, rules that have been broken or areas that have been uh, identified that uh, can be a loophole to fraud and corruption, uh, that the gaps are closed. It's also quite important to ensure that the internal auditing function is doing what it's supposed to be doing and, and, and also that management uh, uh, is cooperating with the internal audit function. Um, also to ensure that if there are um, uh, uh, findings that have been uh, that have come through from the external auditors that those are monitored and followed up upon at each and every uh, step to ensure that we don't have recurring problems that can then open up a loophole and if maybe there was a, a, a something that happened before to ensure that nothing uh, of that nature which was maybe sort of identified as fraud or corruption can occur in the future. It's also very important to ensure that the delegation of authority is being followed upon, everybody is doing what they're supposed to be doing, and therefore nobody is doing uh, somebody else's job or maybe coming out of what their, their roles and, and playing on other uh, 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 people's role. Um, it's also uh, very important to have um, a fraud policy in place. So uh, it, for me, it would be to look at, at whether there is a fraud a policy in place, and if it is there, what are the gaps that are there, and how can we improve it? If it's not there, we need to develop a fraud policy in place and ensure that there is whistleblowing system, and, and find a way also to encourage whistleblowers that will also include ensuring that the whistleblowers uh, are protected and they feel comfortable to come forth with any issues that um, they want to come forth uh, with. I thank you. Thank you. The next honorable member will be Honorable Joseph. Thank you, um, Acting Chair. Um, good evening, Ms. Ivani. Amongst my, my question would be amongst the powers and functions of Pencil is that is to actively promote the development of the previously marginalized languages in South Africa. If you are appointed to the board, how would you ensure that PENSOF execute this mandate? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, it will be very important to ensure that the mandate is followed because for some of us, um, learning that there is an organization called PENSLAB, Pencil, which I did when I once audited it during my articles, um, was very encouraging to know that such an organization exists, which will um, help our country to ensure that we don't lose our languages or indigenous languages. So it will be to, in, to ensure that we track on, on the mandate, we track on what activities have to be done by the pencil, pencil and 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 how far we are at, at, at executing the mandate. And I think it will also be very important in terms of looking at achievements that have been done so far and looking at the gaps that are currently existing to be able to say, how do we improve and how do we ensure that the, the languages are supported? There are quite a number of things that Pencil does, but some of the things... Um, are not quite visible. I must say that I have learned that they, they are, there is an awareness of, 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 I think it was 28 days of, of trying to promote of promoting indigenous language, but I never heard of it. And I think some of the, of, the, of the awareness that are being done are not really visible. So it's quite important to come up with strategies to say, 
what is visible, what can be visible to our people. And that will also talk about trying to do a research to say, where are our people spending time on? How do we find these people? And how do we ensure that this promotion is not only done at villages, but it's done across the country, whether urban areas or in, 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 in rural areas? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, honorable members. Are there follow ups or any questions? Thank you. Uh, can we take this opportunity to thank you, uh, you about coming and applying, and uh, you were amongst who were unfortunately to be shortlisted. Now the only thing that is remaining is that the as this uh, August House will take uh, the scoring and. Uh, giving back to uh, the department and then the department will communicate to the committee and to parliament. Uh, do you want to say something to us? I thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Chair. I really appreciate um, the opportunity of being shortlisted and uh, also uh, just to be able to then come back to uh, uh, the roots to say, by the way, um, our languages are very important uh, and we need to be part of enabling a promotion of this language. Hence, I, I felt I've got interest in being part of this board because I feel I'm also affected. I've got young children who struggle to speak uh, my language and I find it difficult to teach them because I feel the, like yeah there aren't enough um uh, maybe support there isn't enough support also to me to encourage my children to learn and also to say i think it needs to be a collaboration uh, of of the society as a whole not just me as a as a parent but the schools have to be involved the like twitters have to be involved Facebooks have to be involved so we need to then make it a collaboration uh, as a country with partnerships to ensure that the languages are promoted including uh, for the benefit of my children thank you so much thank you so much uh, in that note uh, we are releasing you thank you thank you so much thank you chairperson Can you open the mic, Mr. Uh, Chabelen? Mr. Chabelen? Yes, good afternoon. Um, uh, Afternoon, we're not yet seeing you. Uh, are you in load shedding? No, I am not. Okay, there you are now. Yes, yes. Now we are seeing this beautiful face. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> um, Mr. Chabeleng, you are in front of the honorable members of parliament who are serving uh, in the committee sport as and art culture and which which is a department amongst the departments of a uh, republic of south africa uh, we are having all who's needed to be here from parliament the parliament is giving us a support of all relevant staff that they must be with us all uh, legal gurus who suppose 
uh, to come and watch the process. Thank you to be with us. Now, the only thing that uh, I can tell you uh, is that you have got uh, five minutes to tell us who you are, but in that five minutes, uh, you summarize on what you have told us in these files that are in front of us. And then from there, you have 45 minutes that uh, are given like any other uh, um, candidates. Uh, I nearly also want to say members, all, all candidates. Uh, now to you, uh, Mr. Chabeling, tell us <clears throat> who you are. Um, good, good afternoon, uh, Chair, and uh, good afternoon to all the members present. Uh, my my names are there, but in short, um, I have uh, the right set of skills. I have a qualification. I have a degree in, in, in internal audit. Um, I have worked in various roles in government. I have been an auditor have been a CFO. Uh, I have been an advisor <clears throat> in financial management um, issues uh, in government. I most importantly am currently a board member uh, in my capacity as a volunteer. Um, I have served um, as a member of a college council where um, my responsibilities were more like uh, the, the the one of the board where we provide oversight over financial uh, management issues we make sure that the strategy there's policies the organization is running well there's proper reporting and accountability uh, thank you very much thank you so much uh, with that summary uh, now the next uh, a honorable member who's going to ask you question uh, out of questions uh, is honorable van Dijk. honorable van Dijk. thank you chair welcome ms chabaling the first thank question you. is give us your understanding of the importance of having at least one board member with financial management expertise if you were to be appointed to the board, what role would you play in relation to the existing financial operations? Um, th th thank you for, for that question. Um, the importance of having a one member with financial management background is that when um, the board is supposed to look at the finances of, uh, of the organization, that member is able to provide leadership. Uh, number two, they are able to, on a quarterly basis, when reports come to the board, they are able to identify red flags. Where, in cases where there's over or under spending, the member will be able to identify. They're able to look at the record and identify areas where um, proper reporting is not done, where there is abuse, that member will be able to, to actually advice um when 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 the board is reviewing policies uh, the member in this case will be able to also provide an important role um in providing oversight uh, everything that is reported uh, it, it that member will also be able to make sure that it's properly accounted for when it's time for reporting um uh, did I answer uh, all the questions right? Is there anything missing? You asked about the importance and the role. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are fine. The next honorable member is uh, Honorable Chief Lutuli in Kosi. Hey, hey, it was it was a very long. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, my my question is, is is as follows: What is what is your understanding of the public and public finance management act? 
Act number no, number twenty nine of nineteen ninety nine. How would you ensure that it is applied by the South African Language Board? I thank you. Um, uh, th th thank you um, for the question. My understanding around the uh, Public Finance Management Act uh, is that it is an act which the uh, the, pen the, the the board is expected. Um, as an organization to to actually comply with it is an act that regulates the the, fi the finances uh, of the organization uh, i mean it is an act that regulates the expenditure uh, the revenue it is the act that makes sure that there's oversight over assets. If there are liabilities, it also provides guidance on how uh, 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 all those needs to be taken care of and needs to be properly accounted for. The act does not go alone. It also has its uh, regulation. The regulation makes sure that in areas where certain areas um, are not uh, easy to apply, then the regulation uh, unbundles how those areas need to be applied. Uh, for instance, the Act will say that there has to be reports that come to the board. The accounting officer is responsible to make sure that there is a system. So the regulation um, assists in, 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 in actually providing more explanation. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next honorable member is Honorable Sibia. And thanks, Chaperson. Uh, welcome, Felicia. Uh, what, what is your understanding of the internal audit and enterprise risk management? How would you apply these to Penn South African Language Board? Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, internal audit, um, it's very important and um, in the sense that it intends to, to make sure that there is value that is added to the organization. Value in the sense that um, the day-to-day -day activities will be reviewed by, by internal audit section um to make sure that uh, where controls are weak for instance recommendations are made and we 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 we, we see improvement um enterprise uh, risk management um it's something that the board has a responsibility direct responsibility to make sure that there is a system um uh, of risk management one by ensuring that from time to time they identify areas uh, that may pose a threat areas that are a risk to the achievement of the objectives of the board um they also make sure that uh, those risks are properly managed those risks are properly um if there's a need for resources the organization makes sure that they provide, whether it's budget, whether it's um, human resources, the resources are provided. At the end of the day, when there's the reports that come to to the portfolio, um, we should be seeing a report that talks to how the board has been able to manage the risks of the organization throughout the year. Thank you. In short, that, that's what I can say. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now we are going to Honorable Zondi. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, Ms. Nshabeleng. Good afternoon. Your next question, if you were to be appointed to pencil, yes. what steps would you take to ensure that fraud and corruption does not take place within the organization. Thank you. 
Um, thank you uh, for 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 that uh, question. Um, fraud and corruption uh, in the organization should not take place. One, it is the responsibility of of the board to make sure that fraud and corruption does not take place. But that responsibility uh, can be delegated to the accounting officer. Uh, the accounting officer has to make sure that um, in line with 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 the requirements of PFMA, PF, uh, PFMA says that um, um, PFMA says the accounting officer must make sure that there is a risk management strategy in place. The risk management strategy in it it must have a fraud prevention plan. So one of the first things that we are going to do is that we'll make sure that there is a, 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 a fraud prevention plan. Um, uh, number two, we'll make sure that as part of our risk management, we, we, we have a, a category of risks that talk to, to, to fraud and corruption, which we call them the fraud risks. Uh, but then in the fraud prevention plan, um, in the fraud prevention plan, there are things that we need to have in the fraud prevention plan. One, we need to have um, we need to have uh, things that as an organization we are going to do um, to prevent fraud, number one. Uh, things such as um, um things such as uh, 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 making sure that we've got awareness uh, uh, sessions from time to time when new people come and we have a uh, refresher awareness trainings to say we have a code of conduct as an organization so this is the conduct that is expected from every member um, of the organization as part of the prevention and then we'll have also um number two uh, areas where we we, we 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 proactively um try to detect if there's any fraud one our internal audit unit will be used from time to time to 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 highlight areas where where uh, there are red flags also the the risk register will also help us to identify emerging risks that uh, need to be taken care of. As part of the detec detection, we'll also be having whistleblowing uh, where we can either have our own or we can work with the, the other stakeholders uh, where we have a, a, a hotline where uh, if, if any member of the organization or stakeholders identify that um, the, there's something that can be fraud or corruption, they, they, they report that. And as an organization, number three, we have a responsibility to make sure that we investigate uh, fraud and corruption if reported and make sure that um, we, 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 we conduct it on time, we conduct it in a manner that gives a message to everyone else who's watching to say that should should you be found conducting fraud and corruption uh, we are not just going to let it go but we we, we have a proper resolution uh, which which we, which is communicated that means if um you are you, you we, we have conducted an investigation and you you have been found to be conducting fraud and corruption the 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 the, the 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 resolution i mean the what would be happening to you if we are recovering from you that message will be publicly uh, announced to 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 the community i mean to the organization at large so that it sends a strong message to say that um um do not be tempted to do this because these are the the end results uh, yes, I think uh, we will also from time to time can <clears throat> can just send out um, 
um, some questions to just uh, detect if people are aware that they, they are not supposed to be turning a blind eye on, on fraud and corruption. Also, we'll use the reports that come from Auditor General <clears throat> to check if um, there has been areas of fraud and corruption that um, are highlighted as red flags. Um, we, we, we can also, uh, yeah, I think uh, in a nutshell, that's what I can, I can do. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Don't mind about the kids who are making noise. I've seen that uh, you even wanted maybe to say, please wait, let <laughs> me <laughs> them to shut up. <laughs> uh, Honorable Joseph, we are all mothers and fathers. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, Good evening, Ms. Chaplin. Good evening. The question I will ask is, among the powers and functions of PENSOP, is to actively promote the development of the previously marginalized languages in South Africa. If you are appointed to the board, how would you ensure that the PENSOP ex execute this mandate? Thank you. Um, if I understand the question very well, um, promotion of the previously uh, marginalized um, languages. One, um, we would have uh, awareness sessions. We would also conduct um, campaigns uh, to promote the languages, the previously uh, marginalized languages. Uh, we can also uh, celebrate or or have some days where we we are promoting uh, the use of uh, the previously marginalized languages. Um, the policy research also within the organization will also be important uh, to make sure that these languages are not. Um, uh, forgotten. Also, with our stakeholders, the the the, the departments, uh, the language policy will be advocated to make sure that um, if there's a need for us to 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 have workshops, we will do that. But also, um, make sure that they have policies that promote. Um, also, the use of uh, multi languages. Um, uh, with particular, we would also, I think, um, the, the use of in, 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 translators and interpreters is also important to make sure that on, on, on departments, people have the translators stroke interpreters so that in cases where people don't understand uh, 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 some someone is, is is able to to do that also uh, the the use of dictionaries uh, would also be very important particularly because with languages that have uh, fewer users it, it will be important to make sure that uh, those languages are digitized to make sure that they are not uh, completely uh, distinct. Um, make sure that, um, yeah, I think uh, in a nutshell, that's what I can say. Well, thank there's you. a chat. Out. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chamberlain. Any other follow-up questions or any other questions? Can can we take this opportunity to tell you that uh, so far uh, the questions uh, are, are done and the only role that you are having uh, as the committee is to do a scoring 
but also uh, after that, the Department of Sport, Arts and Culture uh, will communicate the results of your good selves, 25 of you, whilst we, we don't, uh, each department doesn't want more than uh, 15 candidates. We wish you a, a good luck out of uh, those 50, uh, 25 candidates. Uh, if you want to say something, uh, we are allowing you before we release you. Um, thank you, uh, Chair, for, 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 for this opportunity. Uh, on the question that spoke to to risk management, uh, since I still have some time, okay, can I okay. can I take the opportunity to make some additions on that uh, particular That's question? That's all right. You still have time. All right. Uh, thank you. I think uh, one of the things I need something to write. One of the things that I, I I did not mention is that um, in risk management, we, we can also develop a plan, an annual plan, which uh, will indicate a number of areas that during that financial year we will be, um, we will be doing. One, um, as the, one of the first things is that in risk management, we will um, have policies and, and 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 strategies uh, followed by establishment of um, internal committees that can be put in place to that can be put in place to strengthen um, this risk management and then we would also have uh, two types of of risks that we will be identifying as an organization, the strategic risks and the operational risks. Uh, and on a quarterly basis, this would be reported to the board from uh, the level of management. And also, we would make sure that our policies are actually pub publi publi publicized uh, as a way of uh, raising awareness to to our officials to say, um, for instance, we are we are we will not tolerate any fraud and corruption. So that has to go on our website as a policy statement to say, as a, as an organization, this is what um, we believe in. Uh, thank you. Uh, for, for, for that one. And then in internal audit also, I did not mention that one of the committees that the board is expected to establish is the audit and risk committee. Uh, the internal audit and the risk committee would on a quarterly basis be expected to report to these committees and ultimately this the reports that come from these committees will go to the board and then uh, the portfolio will have um, a report in terms of what has transpired during the year. Thank you, uh, Chair Pese. I think uh, I will end it here. You're done now. Don't you want yes. to say something to us? <laughs> no, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Uh, it, it's actually a privilege uh, to be interviewed by your good selves. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay, say something. Uh, and I'm looking forward to us joining uh, the, 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 the organization, the Pence Lab. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Now uh, we are releasing you. Thank you so much. Go well. Don't shout to those kids. We are dead. Um, honorable members, today we are coming to an end, but I want to tell you, honorable members, that you are in the fourth industrial uh, revolution. Uh, anyone has got a right, especially uh, out of the rules of this parliament, 
and that a public must listen and view us. So we must know that uh, everyone is listening to us. We've said, and uh, um, uh, the doctor did tell us that uh, there are those people who are monitoring us. So we must just be our good selves, uh, knowing that uh, the uh, fourth revolutionary industry, uh, it is there in order that uh, any public member who want to get in to listen to us, that's why sometimes they will will be having uh, what U U Doc was telling us because they are listening. Uh, we don't know what they are listening beyond that. Uh, we must be very free and understand that. Uh, today, uh, this is our second day and tomorrow uh, is going to be our last day. And I'm proposing to uh, Ujabu and the rest that during our lunch, we must have a round table uh, when we're having lunch in order that we must talk to each other. So I'm suspecting I'm in order. Uh, thank you, honorable members. If uh, you want to say, if you want to say something, Jabu, don't don't listen to honorable members disturbing you and in turn disturbed me. <laughs> I, I don't know why today some are very hyper. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you so much uh, to everyone who's here and Ujabu and uh, the administrators. They are saying supper is being served. <laughs> the meeting is adjourned.